Okay. Good afternoon. During the declared emergency in the City of Toronto, Committee of Adjustment virtual public hearings are being conducted by electronic means through WebEx, an online digital platform, and streamed on the City of Toronto planning YouTube channel. These measures are necessary to comply with physical distancing requirements in a provincial order that limits attendance at public gatherings. This will be a virtual public hearing, and participants who have registered in advance will be able to make their presentations to the committee using WebEx, an online event that is being moderated by city staff. Anyone wishing to view the hearing may do so by watching on YouTube. Participants who have registered in advance will be connecting either by their computer, a phone or tablet app, or by telephone. All participants will automatically be muted on entry, and when your item is called, each participant will be unmuted by the moderator one person at a time. Uh, the Committee of Adjustment members, we have one member participating by video, Mr. Danny Bellissimo, as well as in person. We have uh, Mr. Neil Palmer on my far left, Mr. Don Taylor on my near left, and my name is Michael Clark and I'm your chair. Um, the registered participants will be participating by audio only and we ask that you mute your devices until you are called on to speak. Land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. In accordance with sections 45 and 53 of the Planning Act, 1990 as amended, this meeting of the Committee of Adjustment of the City of Toronto is now called to order. The Committee of Adjustment considers applications for variances from the provisions of the zoning bylaw that apply to the property, permissions to extend or alter lawful non-conforming uses, and consents to sever properties to create new lots. Anyone who wants to receive a copy of the decision of the Committee on an application must submit a written request for a decision by email. Please ensure that you include your name, address, and email address because Committee of Adjustment and the T-Lab in the event of an appeal will be sending notifications and appeal updates by email. If you do not agree with the decision of the committee, decisions may be appealed to the Toronto Local Appeal Body, T-Lab, or in some limited circumstances to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, LPAT. Appeal instructions are set out at the bottom of the decision of the committee. The hearing procedure will be as follows. We will call each item in the order listed on the agenda for this afternoon's agenda, starting at item number 20. And uh, when you make your submissions, when an application is uncontested, uh, the applicant or agent will make a presentation only if required. The committee may ask questions of the applicant or agent or take the matter into the committee for a decision. On a contested application, each speaker, including the applicant or agent, is given a maximum of five minutes to address the committee. And Mr. Taylor will comment, who's watching the clock when you're approaching the five minute mark. When addressing the committee, please start off by stating clearly your name and address for the record, and please remember to confine your remarks to the matters outlined in the application. The applicant or agent proceeds first, makes a presentation to the committee. Please note that the committee may not entertain revisions to proposals at the hearing today. The committee may decide to defer the application if substantially revised in order to ensure that the revised application is accurate and that all those entitled to notice of the application are informed of the changes. Then, ap individuals either in support or opposed to the application will be invited to speak. Committee members may ask questions of each speaker after they finish their presentations. When all speakers are finished, the applicant a or agent is given an opportunity to rebut and answer those issues and questions that have been raised by the speakers, but not to introduce new evidence or new uh, information. That will then mark the end of the discussion. The, committee is then, the uh, application is then taken into committee for a decision, you'll hear a motion, a vote, and a decision being rendered. Uh, some preliminary matters, any declarations of interest of panel or staff for the items in this afternoon's time slot? Hi, Mr. Chair, this is Barb Bartisik. I have a conflict for item 34, 38 You Know Drive. I live within the notification area. Okay, that'll be noted. Any other conflicts on this afternoon's agenda? No, okay. Um, okay, so we can uh, 
you can get started. The first application we're going to hear, as I stated, is one Seal Cove Drive unit uh, item number 20 on the agenda. And this is an application to construct a two-story east side addition, a rear covered deck, a covered French porch, and a second story addition above the existing dwelling. There are uh, eight variances. Uh, we have a cover letter, three support letters, and transportation has a condition of approval. Um, they want a notation uh, on the revised on a revised site plan, and that's all we have. Um, this, we only have one registered speaker for this application, being the agent Graham Barrett. Mr. Good Barrett. afternoon, committee members. Welcome. Good afternoon, Ms. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, yes, I'm the agent for the owners of One Seal Cove Drive. This is Graham Barrett of 1575 Dundas Street West in Toronto. Okay, uh, let's see if committee members would like a brief presentation on this application or just uh, ask some questions. Okay, okay, and if there's no questions for Mr. Barrett, unless Mr. Barrett would like to add anything, are we ready for a motion? Um, I would I would just like to uh, mention that um, we have worked extensively with planning staff to arrive at this compromise. So it's, uh, it's something that works well for staff and for the owners. Um, I have not seen those transportation comments and I did take a look at the AIC website. Um, but um, if you could, if you could please explain what that is again, I would appreciate sure. it. I think they want, uh, here it is. Um, based on the foregoing, we have no objections to the minor variance application from a transportation perspective. Subject to the following. One, the site plan shall be revised to include the following notation. Quote, the driveway widening shall be constructed to the applicable city des design standards and the above shall be undertaken to the satisfaction of transportation. So both to have that notation and then obviously the transportation services will have to approve that dr widening. That's all it says. Sure, that, sound, that sounds totally reasonable and doable. Um, if somebody could maybe uh, send me a copy of that, I would appreciate it and I'll pass okay. it on to the designers. Okay, perhaps staff can... Get a copy to Mr. Barrett, or is that now on the website? It is posted to the web. It's yes. posted on the web. Okay. Okay. And we do great. have Thank your you. covering letter, so. Uh, okay. Anyone have any further questions for Mr. Barrett? Is someone ready to make a motion? I'll uh, make a motion. Uh, I'll move for approval. Uh, the application meets the four tests uh, of the Planning Act for minor variance, uh, subject to the. Uh, condition of the engineering department. Okay, thank you, Mr. Palmer. Seconded for Mr. Palmer's motion. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. All in favor? You have unanimous approval. Thank you, Mr. Wonderful. Barrett. We'll thank see you, very you much. again. We'll hear you nice again. <laughs> okay. Maybe we'll hear, maybe thank we'll you. see you eventually at some point in the future. Okay, um, next item is item number 2135 King George Road. This is to construct a new detached dwelling, and there are four variances. Uh, height, it's three-story, there's a context plan. Planning has provided us a report for information that includes certain Metrolinx conditions and a Metrolinx letter that we also have. And register to speak on this item is David D'Souza. And um, I don't believe we have any other speakers. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, how are you? Good, you want to just state your name formally for the record, please? Uh, my name's David D'Souza. I reside at 44B Ridewind Avenue, Toronto, and I'm representing my children uh, that I'm building the house for. Okay, so you've seen the uh, Metrolinx conditions and letter that are referred to in the planning report? Yes, we've gone through extensive negotiations with Metrolinx, um, over the last two years, and we have addressed uh, planning issues on it. Basically, just give you a background, gentlemen, on this property. Sorry, if there I could just interrupt. Um, Mr. D'Souza, you're also here for item 32, which is two doors down, and I believe oh, that's my, the that's my That's my son-in-law, and he'll be dealing with it on his own behalf. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so we should, we're not going to hear these together. They have the same Metrolinx conditions and planning report. It's if, you want, if you would like to do it together, that's fine with us because it's 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 basically the same thing. So, you know, the Metrolinx conditions are the same. Mm -hmm. 
Madam Secretary Treasurer, do you think we should go out of order and uh, do this one as well, or? Uh, we can hear them well, one after another, no other maybe. Speakers. No, hold on. No, there's no other speaker on that. It just list Matthew Matai is the speaker, I guess. Yeah, he's, son. Uh, he's my law. These were purchased uh, for my kids. Okay. It's up to the committee. I mean, it, the circumstances are identical and the issues are the same, I believe, for the two properties. So you may want to hear them one after another then. Okay. Just to. Yeah, the same planning report for information, five variances. There's no other, nothing else that's any different. So, okay, let's deal with this one first and then the other one. So first on this okay. one, if there are any questions uh, for Mr. D'Souza. And if there's no questions for him, as someone ready to make a motion? Do you want to give me a little bit more background on it? Uh, do you, would you like some more background from, uh, no? I think you've told us enough. We have your context plan and we've reviewed the plans. Okay. Mr. Chair, I find just very- to you know, Just to let you know, uh, there were three previous houses there that Metrolinx uh, basically demolished in order to do uh, rail work at the back. Um, the houses that are being put on those lots are quite extensively smaller footprints than what were there previously. And we have done the setbacks greater than what uh, were there previous. Okay. Okay, and it's good to hear you're working with Metrolinx on this and have been so that you're cognizant of these conditions and what you're gonna have to do. Yeah. Okay, so I think Mr. Taylor was just about to uh, weigh in on this. Mr. Chair, I find the variances meet the four tests under the Planning Act, and I move for approval subject to the uh, conditions set out by Metro Links. Okay, thank you. Seconder for that. Um, yeah, I'll second. Did you get the, sorry, did you get the uh, forestry condition? No. Didn't know there was one. Oh yeah, and uh, sorry, do you want to, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Urban yeah. forestry condition three? Yeah, yeah. cash in lieu uh, to the city. Sorry, I did miss that. So I'll, okay. I'll second it subject to that. Uh, Thank you, okay, all in favor with that and the uh, inclusion of the forestry condition, unanimous approval. Thank you, Mr. D'Souza. Now we'll move over to item number uh, can, I, can I just ask you something? Do you want Matt to come on this one now or go on his own computer? Uh, okay, he's are you there. authorized to speak for him or you're going to have to get No, he can speak for himself. Okay. So, well, he can we can call item 32 now. Yes. And the agent for that application can speak. Okay, so item know. number 32 31 King George Road. Uh, this matter was deferred from February 13th, 2020 to deal with Metrolinx and we now have this five variances planning report same planning report for information containing the Metrolinx conditions. Uh, and that's all we have is uh, Mr. Mateo, I think it is. Hi. Matthew Matei. Matei. Can you just state your name, put address for the record, yep. sir? Uh, my name is Matthew Matei. Uh, I believe the address on file would be 292061 Weston Road. Okay. Um, and um, I, it's the same conditions as the previous lot. We're just Correct. looking to rebuild. Okay. Yeah. Okay, committee members, same as the uh, previous application, uh, which was on item number 21, uh, 31 King George. Someone ready to make a motion? I'm ready to make a motion. Uh, I move approval of the recommendations and re recommend approval of the variances as read before us. And, keeping with and subject to. Uh, the condition, the Metrolinx condition contained in the staff report? Subject, subject to the same uh, condition of Metrolink that was prepared, yes. And is there an urban forestry yeah. condition on this as well? I don't believe so. No. I don't think so. I could not find one. No, there is. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bellissimo. Seconder for Mr. Bellissimo's motion. Mr. Palmer, all in favor? You have your approval. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so we'll now move back to item number 22 for Kingsley Gardens. Uh, this is an application uh, 
for a two-story rear addition. There's seven variants. We do have an applicate, applicant requ requesting a deferral uh, and, and then planning supports deferral. And there's nothing really much else other than that. So we have a deferral request. Is um, Gianni Ms. Regina Mr. there, the applicant agent? Applicant yes. Agent. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee panel. Uh, Ms. Wilstaff, my name is Johnny Regina. Just ha hang on for one second, sir. I just want to make sure there's another speaker registered. Paul Collette at Six Kingsley right next door. Is okay. Mr. Is Mr. Collette with us? Yes, I am. Okay. So um, just there's been a, I don't know if you checked online and if this was up there, the applicant has uh, sent in a request for a deferral, I assume to make changes. Their client needs to review and digest the effects of the recommendations of approval, and uh, they're going to have to make some changes, I guess, based on the what they've heard. And planning is in support of the deferral request. I, are you in support of deferral? Because it sounds like they'll make uh, changes that may, may be more amenable to you, and as well, I don't know what your concerns are at this point, but perhaps you can touch base with your neighbor, and uh, they'll know your concerns when they're working on making changes. Well, I, 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 I was a bit late submitting a letter to the, to uh, describe what my complaints are. So, but it's on, they have been posted. So you could have a look at them there. Yeah. So it sounds I've, like I've, they may be making more changes. That's the reason they're asking for a deferral and staff is sure. there, planning staff is, uh, is, is in favor of the deferral so that they can do that. And you can go online and check to see what the discussion is, and perhaps they can also concern, uh, in, incorporate your concerns and try to address your concerns when they do their redesign. The matter will be re, uh, recirculated once they have revised plans. You will get a, another notice in the mail, and in the meantime, it gives you a chance to digest what changes they're going to make, and maybe it'll be more to your to your liking. Mr. Okay. Chair, can I? Uh, so it's Johnny Regina, the applicant. Yep. There's been a change in event, and that's uh, sorry to me to cut you off. There, my apologies, uh, but my client is actually withdrawn. There's two requests we're we're putting forth as of today. Um, number one is that we are requesting a withdrawal of the application, so we are pulling the application. Um, and number two, the uh, there's an issue with regards to the original charge of the application fee that the client has paid. Uh, they originally charged. Uh, uh, okay, anyway, the, okay, we, we're in the middle of a hearing here, so if you tell me you want to withdraw, first you looked like you were looking for a deferral, now you're looking to withdraw, and in terms of dealing with whether you're entitled to any portion of your feedback, which I doubt because the work's been done and you're actually on an agenda, uh, but you can certainly deal with staff, but uh, we don't deal with well, that. You have to make your, defer, your, your return of fee request to the, um, to the director, and uh, so... I got to know, are you looking to defer at this point or you're looking to withdraw? We are looking to withdraw at this point. And we were told that we have to bring up this issue with the financial to the committee panel is what I was told through an email and saying that we're not asking for a refund. They've mischarged um, the original fee for a new house construction was 3,700 where they should have been charged uh, 1652. So we're not asking for a refund on the 1652. Okay. So I asked for a written request, which I believe you have submitted. That will be right. done administratively. That's not before the committee. The only thing before the committee now will be to close the file. Okay, so then it would be withdrawal, correct? Yes. Okay, yeah, because uh, back October 21st, you wanted to defer. So, okay, so if you're going to withdraw, so I apologize. we can, we can, I apologize. We can My do that. Yep. My and like I said, you can, we're not trying to uh, slough you off, but you have we don't deal with fee Absolutely. refund issues. So... And fee mischarged, did you were charged the wrong amount? You can deal with staff and administratively, we don't deal with that. So, motion to uh, close the file. I'll move to close the file for the applicant's request. I'll move to uh, close the file at the applicant's request. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Seconded by Mr. Palmer. Thank you. All in favor? Okay, the file's been closed. Okay, so Mr. Collette, uh, if you've been following along, the applicant first asked for a deferral. City planning was yeah. okay with that, but now they're telling us they're just withdrawing their whole application. They're we're going to close the file. Yeah, that's fine with me. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Next application is item 23. This is a big one. A lot of registered speakers on this one. This is an application uh, for 41 Thompson Avenue. It's an application to construct a new detached dwelling with an attached garage. Uh, there are five variances, including uh, GFA from 185 meters to 285 meters, 0.05, but it didn't give us the percentages. I don't know if that's an oversight. I noticed we have a covering letter from Mr. Flynn. Uh, planning is recommending refusal of variance two. Uh, Councillor Grimes agrees with planning's recommendation to refuse variance two for FSI. We have 27 and 21 in support. We actually have in 60, and uh, we have a lot of support and a lot of opposition. We have support and we have opposition. So, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Hold um, on. And sorry. We have comparables. We have planning report, the council letter. Um, we have it looks like at least 12 letters of support and a huge number of opposition. 20, 37 letters of opposition. And it looks like we have registered uh, to speak in addition to Mr. Flynn, the agent. Uh, it looks like he had one, two, three, four, five speakers, including the next door neighbor at 39, who's listed first, I guess, is the one, and 35, um, or 39, I guess, is the most directly affected, as well as other speakers on Brentwood and Royal York Road. So, Mr. Chairman, with regards to uh, we, uh, Michael Flynn, the agent, is here. Uh, Mr. Stefanovic at 39 Thompson Avenue, uh, he, we were unable to reach him. So that's the first listed speaker at 39 Thompson. Yep. Um, we spoke with Mr. Rob Schull. He will not be joining us. Uh, but instead, uh, Birute Luxinate at 900 Royal York will be representing uh, him. Oh, okay, it looks like it's um, clear. It's okay. I, I was also asked by Michael Green, who is, I believe, the chairperson of TOCA, if they could speak in a certain order. So their preferred speaking order is number one, Paul Schofield, number two, Biruta Luxinate, yep. and number three, Mike Green. Okay, so we have three speakers. Mr. Stefano Stefanovic, or next door, is not going to be uh, speaking. Hmm, it looks like he's a surveyor. Like he's a surveyor. Okay, um, Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, you're welcome. You, uh, welcome. You, uh, I guess you uh, need a presentation need a from me on, on this one. All right, thank you. Probably do. We've got a lot of opposition lot of and, uh, and uh, some, some support, support as well. Support as well. Mr. Flynn, yes, sir, are, are you are watching you or paying, or paying, attention, paying with attention with two devices? With two because devices, we're getting, because a, lot we're getting of, a lot of. Activity. I'm on my telephone, which is a landline. I don't have any other device with a volume on, but I can turn my computer off if that's bothering you. It's just the committee members. The committee members. We can all hear what we we're hear saying. What we're repeated. Saying repeated. Oh, okay. Well, let me try shutting it down and see if that helps. Now, the only thing else anywhere near it is my. Oh, so I'll shut that down. Still happening. Is that happening? A, has that improved at all? Testing. 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 Still happening. Still happening. Really? Hmm. Okay, so what we'll okay, do, so is, what you'll we'll do speak, is you'll speak, and then when the committee then members when have questions, you'll be muted so that we don't hear us on repeat. Mm. On repeat. That's fine. It shouldn't be happening now. Hmm. Uh, mind you, I have wireless keyboards and things like that. That might be. It, it doesn't happen it when you speak. When you... So let's hear your presentation. We won't interrupt, and then we'll figure out. We'll we'll turn that off so when we want to speak to you. All right. Although okay. hold on, it Although, seems like on. it's better now. Like... Oh, okay. He's just testing. Okay, we'll we'll be okay. Uh, so let's start your five minutes now. Okay. We already started it. We All right. I, I... All right. I'd like to start out. Uh, by talking about the designation of the proposed project. In the uh, public hearing notice and in the planning report, you will see that it's a, it deals with a new 
detached dwelling. This is, in fact, not a new detached dwelling. There's an existing home which is being renovated and added to. It's actually one and a half stories currently. And the plan is to take the second story off completely and build a new second story and a rear addition. So I just want everybody to understand that things like side yard setbacks are existing situations. The eaves setback is an existing situation. So even though they are showing it as minor variances required, they are actually existing and shouldn't be required. But since building department tells us we have to have it, then we will obviously have to have it. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the uh, bylaw, which is site-specific bylaw for the Toka neighborhood. That's bylaw 1992-22. So if you look at the research from uh, the city's portal, you would find that within 500 meters, there are 202 approved variances or applications within 500 meters in the last 10 years. Within 1,000 meters, there are 693 approved minor variances or applications in the last 10 years. So it's obvious that that site specific bylaw hasn't worked and people have continuously applied. The next thing about those applications is that many, have them, many of them have been 3,000 square feet. That seems to be a magic number in that neighborhood. And if it's less than 3,000, it's acceptable. If it's more than 3,000, it's not acceptable. Then let's talk about the uh, a planning report. We tried to talk to the planner. She never made herself available to us, but she used uh, precedent to come up with her opinion. As we all know, there is no such thing as precedent, and you're not allowed to use precedent. Then we move on to the uh, counselor. And the counselor's position was whatever planning said, they would say. So if I'm arguing that planning's comment is not valid, then neither is the counselor's. And I spoke extensively with uh, Mary Campbell on that subject, and they, they're pretty simple about it. If planning doesn't like it, then we don't like it. So that's my argument on that one. Then you go to the four tests. Well, actually, I should review the uh, variances, I suppose, if I can find it in here. Oh, here it is. So lot coverage, as you will have seen, is, is modest. They're asking for 36.8% when 33% is allowed. If you look at the chart of variances approved in the neighborhood and the uh, numbers on that chart, you will find that there are many, many approvals that exceed 33%. And that's, is that and for that, new builds? For because new like, builds? You mentioned, like you mentioned, oh, here I'm oh, getting, here my echo. getting my echo. But um, anyway, just please continue, sorry. I won't interrupt. Right. I won't interrupt. Other than I'd like, if could staff like in the meantime look while Mr. Flynn is talking, variance number three must should be reflected as a percentage. It just says maximum is 185 square meters. There he's looking to do 285 square meters. The way that bylaw is written, that there's a percentage, and then it says or a maximum of 185, whichever is less. So I think that's why they've just given the 185. Oh, so it's not reflected as the, a percentage. It's just yeah. absolute. Doesn't that depend on the size of the lot, or anyway? Um, there's a long story behind that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Flynn. Please continue. No problem. Continue. All right. So variance number two is regarding a gross floor area, which I mean, you can use the metric numbers or you can convert. It's approximately 2,800 square feet, which is less than the 3,000 magic number in that neighborhood. And then you go on to, uh, where's the FSI gone? FSI for this uh, proposal is 73%. 
Again, if you look at the chart of approved variances, you will see that there were many approvals above that. So this number, the magic number, which seems to be the main crux of the objections, is within keeping of other approvals and the neighborhood. And then we go on to side yard setback, which I've explained is an existing condition. Those walls are being maintained and the construction would be on the second story and in the rear of the house. Dwelling height, although it exceeds the allowed, it's very modest at 0 0.4 meters or effectively 14 inches. And the roof eaves are an existing situation. So if the designation of the house had been uh, addition renovation, which I believe it should be, then those two variances, the side yard setback and the eave setback, would not even be included in this notice. So they would be looking for only three minor variances. So getting back to the 2,800 square feet and the FSI. FSI is based on the area of the lot. It has nothing to do with comparable houses in the neighborhood. So some would argue that the FSI at 0.73 is high, but they're not building anything beyond what is on the street. And the OMB has, and T-Lab have ruled that if a house is generally fitting into the neighborhood, so in other words, in character, then the number doesn't matter. It's a technical number, not a practical number. Okay. So if you're walking down the street, am I out over five minutes? You're, yeah, you're, you're significantly yeah. over, but yep. just try to wrap up because I know we have a couple of speakers. I gave you the lecture and I interrupted you once, so just try to wrap it up. But So if all these lots are sort of comparable, is your lot any different? If all the lots are more or less the same size, I'm looking at the key map here, it's not like your lot looks any different than the other lots in the street. Lots in the street. I guess it does, it does curve when you get further, when you get further on the, the street does curve, so. But anyway. Yeah. So there is differences in size. Yeah. But yeah. again, what I'm saying is 3,000 square foot on this lot isn't going to be a lot different than 3,000 square, square feet on any other lot. So I'm suggesting to you that the FSI is in keeping and it meets a four test. Lastly, I'd like to talk about the letters of support and the letters of objection. If you look at the map that we provided, you'll see that the letters of objection are well spread out far away from the proposal, whereas the letters of support are relatively close or you know, compact to the requested variance site. <clears throat> so I would say that the four tests, it's a in keeping with the official plan, in keeping with the zoning bylaw, because it uh, maintains most of the performance regulations, generally appropriate for the development of the land and minor, because there is no impact okay. Okay. compared to other properties. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank uh, you, Flynn. Mr. Quest, uh, just a quick, quest, just a quick, I'm just wondering, just maybe wondering you can turn them off so we don't get the uh, feedback. It looks like we got two planning reports, may or more, which more or less say the same thing, October the 23rd and then October the 26th. Is there some difference? Am I missing something? We got two planning uh, staff reports. They look, you know, are they, is there anything different between those? And the question is, the um, question in, is um, <laughs> for Mr. Flynn, um, you started off by saying this is, shouldn't have been considered a new build but additions because you kept up more than 50% of the wall. So why did planning do that and why did you, if it affects the variances, like you say, certain things are as built, it's already there, as opposed to looking at it as if it's new build, they go back to first principles. So I'm just wondering why that was done and why you accepted it. The other thing is, given that they reject, they don't say that the variance of uh, 0.73 for GFA should be reduced, they just say refuse it, which means you're at 0.45, which is meaning you reject the whole application. Usually they do that only when they've gone to the applicant to try to reduce it and they've said, sorry, I want to go in at that, and then they just go back to 0.45. But I'm surprised that they're not, that, 
and they didn't give any verbiage as they did in some other applications today where it says we actually approached the applicant and suggested they make changes and they said, uh-uh, we want to go with this. They don't, unless I don't, I don't see them saying that here. So I'm just wondering why they're just saying flat out, no, 0.45, take it, you know, and not going from 0.73 to point of saying, okay, something else is reasonable, 0.6, or they just said, no, refuse it. So that's exactly, and I I was surprised to see that myself. Okay. Typically, planning department would ask you to reduce to 0.68. That seems to be a magic number with planning. In this case, we spoke to Mary Campbell in the counselor's office. She said, "Go to planning and talk to planning." So we attempted that, and got nowhere. And the planner, if I'm correct, said, "I've already written my letter. I'm not talking to you." Anyway, okay, so, so that's what happened there. Okay. And on the other issue, the new versus addition renovation, that's what the building department designates that. And I mean, this could be a little complicated, but before amalgamation, North York used a definition that each floor had to be 50% maintained. The Examiners that are now in Etobicoke are used to those kinds of interpretations. So they interpret it in the North York fashion, not the, not the Etobicoke fashion. And that's why they are calling it a new bill. I don't think in this case that the committee uh, should penalize these people because you have an examiner who has a, an interpretation that isn't native to Atomico. And that's typical throughout the city. Every There has never been a harmonization of interpretation okay. between Anyway, Mr. Flynn, let's, I have Flynn, the answer to my I question. I didn't, you know, I asked you the question, but I think I, you accepted, I guess, what they did, and that's what's before us. So let's see if there are any other questions before we move on to the, uh, the neighbors. Uh, yes, question, Mr. Flynn. I think you indicated that the side yard setbacks only apply to the existing dwelling. So I'm going to look at the front of the dwelling. It appears that there's a couple of additions at the front of the dwelling. What are the setbacks on those two additions at the front of the dwelling? That's the garage being pushed forward, and it meets the front yard setback. Uh, no, but what are the uh, side yard the setbacks? Side because you indicated that the side yard was on the existing dwelling only and shouldn't uh, have been in this application. So I want to know what the side so yard setbacks are on the additions at the front of the dwelling. Oh, let me look. I'll have to look that up for you. All right, I'll, I'll refer All right, you to I'll, drawing A101. And it appears that the side yard setbacks match the existing dwelling. So therefore, so therefore the side yard the setback, side yard requested, setback requested, requested is for the additions, for as, the additions well. as well. And I assume right. and that I would assume be for the Eve, Eve um, um, minor variance as well. Minor variance as well. You are correct. But the additions in line with the existing, line, right? Existing, He's not going right? through the house. They maintain the same That's side correct. lines as the existing house. Yes, but I think Mr. Yes, Flynn think Mr. indicated to us that those side yard setbacks were for the existing dwelling only and shouldn't have been in this application. That's what he told us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Based on your uh, observation, yes, they should be. Well. It usually shows us an, as a variance, but then the applicant says, well, it's existing, and then tells us either the addition is built in line with it, which I guess it is, even though you didn't imply that initially, which is mis what Mr. Palmer's showing up. So the existing side yards have been, con for the existing property, is being continued for the addition as well, which is usually the way it is. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, so let's, okay, um, let's unless uh, anyone has any con initial questions for Mr. Flynn, there'll be a chance further on, I guess, based on what we hear from the neighbors. So uh, the order of speakers, I guess, we've been asked to do is Paul Schoelfield of 35 Thompson is going to be the first speaker. Yes. Can I proceed? Yeah, please start off by stating your name and address for the record. Will do. 
Okay, my name is Paul Schofield and I have lived at 35 Thompson Avenue, a few houses north of the proposed development for 25 years. And so, you know, we've coordinated three people to speak today, so we don't uh, take up the committee's time with uh, duplicate uh, discussions. I want to say that this property is situated amongst 330 houses in Thompson Orchard, an area of small one, one and a half, and two-story Tudor-style homes built in the 30s and 40s, where most lots are small and substandard in side, size. The applicant at 41 Thompson is requesting an FSI of 0 0.73, which calculates out to 3,100 square feet, not Mr. Flynn's 2,800, uh, on a typical small Thompson Orchard lot. And we don't agree with Mr. Flynn's assessment that an FSI of 0 0.73 is well within the range of variances, and that uh, 3,000 square feet is a magic number that's used in this area. Um, an FSI of 0 0.73 is large when compared to variances granted on the approximate two blocks of Thompson Avenue and the greater Thompson Orchard area. I note two houses immediately north of this property were both built within the last number of years. Both are under 0 .07 uh, and both under 3,000 square feet. He acknowledges that there's been many variances in the area and we agree and we have looked at notices of decisions for 85 houses in the Thompson Orchard area granted over the past 15 years. With information on only 31 houses, Mr. Flynn's data is incomplete and inaccurate. For 64 Brentwood, he lists the FSI as 0 0.718, which was refused by Committee of Adjustment and subsequently approved at 0 0.68. This data point should be corrected. Also, the top line of the chart in his, that he's posted includes the property next door to 41 Thompson, which is 39 Thompson, and at an FSI of 0 0.77, which has not yet been reviewed by the committee. This data point should be removed. Based on the data we have from the past 15 years, 10 of the 43 houses in the first blocks of Thompson Avenue, Avenue that have been granted an average FSI of 0 0.59. In fact, 100% of the houses, one block in either direction of 41 Thompson, have an FSI no greater than 0 0.68. Therefore, the requested FSI of 0 0.73 is clearly an outlier in the immediate neighborhood. Over the same 15 years, 61 of the houses in the Greater Thompson Orchard area were granted a variance for FSI. The average was 0 0.6 and the range 0 0.45 to 0 0.74. At the highest end of the range, four of these houses have identical FSIs of 0 0.74 as part of the same development on Cosmo Road. These four houses are not appropriate comparators as Cosmo Road is separate and apart from the Thompson Orchard area it has no road connection with the rest of the neighborhood and can only be accessed from Bloor Street. It was developed 30 years after the rest of Thompson Orchard and the housing stock is very different. But most importantly, when these four houses came to committee in 2013, two of our presenters, Mike Green and unfortunately Rob Shule can't join us, witnessed the committee accept the arguments put forth by the agent, Mr. Flynn, that Cosmo was so divorced from the rest of Thompson Orchard that it could never be used as a comparator for the Thompson Orchard neighborhood, regardless of the variances requested. So it would be inappropriate to now use the FSI of these houses on Cosmo to justify a variance request for a house on Thompson, as he displays in his chart. Further, the city planner confirmed by email that she reviewed the houses on Cosmo Road and concluded that these examples were not comparable to the redevelopment of 41 Thompson Avenue from community planning's perspective. Since these four Cosmo Road houses are not appropriate as comparators, that leaves only two houses in the Thompson Orchard area with an FSI above 0.7. One house was 0 0.73 at 59 Cliveden and one with an FSI of 0 0.71 at 29 Van Dusen. These two houses therefore clearly do not represent the most frequently occurring nor prevailing character of the neighborhood. The applicant's request for 0 0.73 is an outlier. So whether you compare it to the immediate neighborhood or compare it to the greater Thompson Orchard area, you come up with the same conclusion. The request for an FSI of 0 0.73 is an outlier, does not represent prevailing FSI of the neighborhood, and it cannot be considered minor. It is too much house on too small a lot.
It doesn't respect or reinforce the existing physical character of the neighborhood. And because it has the potential to impact future development in the area, it doesn't maintain the general intent and purpose of the official plan. This position is sort of supported by city planning staff who I've spoken to, and the October 26th letter is the correct letter, describing it as a new build, as identified by the zoning examiner. And they did their own analysis comparing the proposed FSI to the neighboring residential properties and surrounding neighborhood and found the proposed FSI is not consistent with the prevailing physical character of the neighborhood and exceeds the scale of development contemplated in the zoning bylaw. As a result of this analysis, community planning is recommending the variance for FSI be refused, as you've heard. We agree with the conclusion reached by the city planner, which is supported by the Councilor Grimes, Grimes and requests that committee refuse the application. Okay. Thank you. Thank you time. very much, uh, Mr. Schofield. Very good presentation. Uh, next speaker is Barute Luxonate. I'm sorry for if there's my pronunciation is, is off. No, it's great. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? So you're a lawyer on acting on behalf of Robert Schull. I understand. And I've read Mr. Uh, Schull's letter. Correct? Yes, but I am, I am not appearing as a lawyer. I'm oh, okay. just a resident. Okay. Appearing in my own, on my own okay. behalf. Yes. Sorry, I just took that because I looked at your email address, but that's fine. You're appearing as a neighbor. Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. All right, so yeah, so my name is Guruji Luxanite. I do live at 900 Bell York Road, and I've been in this area ever since immigrating to Canada as a little girl with my mom from Europe. I attended Our Lady of Sorrow School, which is just north of the neighborhood, the fate of which we're actually deciding today. Although Thompson Avenue is not directly adjacent to my home, I consider Thompson Avenue as my immediate vicinity because I walk on the street on a virtually daily basis to reach my neighbors, the near, nearby Brentwood Library, our Lady of Sorrows Church, or to just go for a walk in my beautiful, unique, old neighborhood. Um, but I am appearing um, today not on my own behalf, but rather on behalf of my friends Rob and Linda Scholl, who live at 48 Thompson Avenue, which directly faces the property at issue and the development of which will impact them even more than me. Um, I will do my best to convey their and all of our neighborhood's sense of distress about this application. First of all, although the applicant um, uh, states that um, it's a renovation or an addition, um, I'm sure you don't need to be taken to the authorities, but the relevant bylaw states that a building is not lawfully existing if more than 50% of the main walls of the first story or above are removed and or replaced. The project plans indicate that in fact more than 50% of the existing main walls of the existing structure are projected to be replaced. And this was also the opinion of the zoning examiner. So for a new home, the old metrics, which the current home, which was built in 1942 enjoys, would no longer be available and the current date requirements must be respected. So I know that you referred to the existing walls um, enjoying the setbacks of 0 0.5 or three meters and 0 0.73 meters. Um, um, Bar sorry, sorry uh, Baruti, I would, I would use my time. Yes. We've already established it's been, planning yes. is given to us as a new build. Mr. Flynn disagrees okay. with that, but it's so, looking as a new build. I would move on from that point. Okay, so, it is, but in any case, there is- It's a new build, according right. to, as far as we- So would, it's a new build, so, so the existing setbacks um, are not should not be available to this new house. Yeah. Um, and and they're they're adding a new section that I mean as a new section it must obey their new requirements of the setback of, of being 2.1 meters. But instead they're offering to, to or asking for, for to be allowed to be built at 0 0.4 meters. Which I mean, there's no reason why a brand new addition cannot now honor the the required setbacks, and it just indicates that these requirements are quite aggressive and um, overall not within the spirit of the neighborhood. They're also requesting a height variance, which is a significant concern because this is a traditionally single story or bungalow neighborhood, and a towering structure would, in a low rise neighborhood would make a huge like a shocking impact. Um, there's also a requir uh, required variance for um, lot coverage. 
um, from the 33% to 36.8. So again, that's th that's not a minor variance request. So each of the variances that are requested are non-minor, and together they would comprise a huge variance that would not have a precedent. And if permitted, it would have a very significant and negative impact on the neighborhood. I know that the proposed house may look nice, um, and 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 change and new things are 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 good in some cases. But what is proposed does not belong on Thompson Avenue. It's the massive metrics requested are not reasonable and completely unsuitable for this old traditional neighborhood. And if permitted, it would result in overdevelopment um, and would not respect or reinforce the existing physical character of it. Um, and also would have potential for future developments, uh, set a precedent for, for things that are for, for flippers who have no interest in staying and enjoying and protecting this neighborhood for the future. So um, the overall impact on the neighborhood would be negative and opposite to the to, to the purpose of the official plan. And I think that the the four tests here are not met. The application is not minor in nature. It's not appropriate or desirable for the area, and it's not in keeping with the purpose and intent of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. And just in brief conclusion, I would like to take you to the letters of objection. Um, 29 current residents, as opposed to the letters of support, which came from some only former residents who don't live anywhere close to this neighborhood. In this case, our letters of objection are due from the immediate neighborhood. Um, and who, 29 letters came in uh, from people, concerned people who took the time to write to you their concerns, including four homes opposite uh, from 41 Thompson to directly north of the property at being at 35 and 37 Thompson Avenue and three homes behind it on Brentwood Road. These 29 individually written letters provide detailed arguments about how the proposed application would directly and negatively affect the neighborhood's interests. And you also received letters of opposition from the professional planners at community planning and uh, from the Thompson Orchards uh, Community Association or TOCA okay. and from the city councilor. Okay. I would really hope that- Okay, the can, you, can you wrap up please? Cause you're over five minutes. Yes. Thanks. Yes, I, and Mr. Flynn was at seven minutes, but I would yeah. I would hope that you would fi find the opposition letters more meaningful and credible than those of, uh, in support and refuse this application. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for that. And uh, you're right, I let you go over a little. I let the previous speech from Mr. Schofield go over a little bit because this is important stuff. And in fairness, um, Mr. Flynn had a lot to explain and you'll have a, over 15 minutes between the three of you, so just wanted to get everything out, so I let you go on too. Thank you for a good presentation, and our la last speaker in opposition, in addition to all those letters, is Mike Green from TOCA. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Michael Green from 26 Brantwood Road South. Um, I'd like to start by pointing out that Mr. Flynn's map had numerous errors, as he neglected to include six letters of objection from 46, 66, and 70 Thompson, 42 Brentwood, and 48 and 49 Cliveden. Two letters of support were never submitted, although they showed on his map, and these are 54 Thompson and 43 Cliveden. A review of the 24 support letters shows 15 of the 24 are basically form letters, which are a pretty low level of support, as, it, as it's not difficult to collect signatures at the door of friendly neighbors, and I don't imagine much, if any time, would have been spent analyzing the variances. Of the remaining nine letters, five were written by people who don't even reside in the Thompson Orchard area, including London and Ajax. Two letters came from the property owners who do not reside on Thompson. One just finished developing and the property, and it's already for sale. The second, right next door to number 41, has an application in with the committee asking for a floor space index of 0 0.77. And I don't think it's much of a stretch for me to suggest that he might have a vested interest in seeing you approve 0 0.73 today. Most of the comments in the support letters appear to be little more than personal references and not an analysis of the variances on whether the house will reinforce the prevailing physical character of the neighborhood. We conclude these letters are in support of the applicant, which is fair, but not the application. I would hope the committee would find 
the opposition letters more meaningful and credible than those in support. It was interesting that Mr. Flynn, in his letter to the committee, brought up the divisional court ruling of uh, de Gasper. It's worthwhile maybe remembering some of the key statements in that judgment, as almost word for word they could easily apply to this application. Some of the comments were, an applicant needs to establish a hardship or a need for the variances other than homeowners preference for that particular size or style of building. They should be able to outline technical or physical reasons why not being able to comply with the zoning bylaws. And a minor variance is a privilege and the applicants for variances must demonstrate why they cannot adhere to the zoning bylaw. And the applicant needs to demonstrate something more than a personal preference, which I think is the situation here. I think it's unfortunate and a missed opportunity that the applicant seems to have taken an inflexible approach with this application. Other developments in the neighborhood have benefited from community discussions, um, discussions with community planning and the council's office, and sometimes including Mr. Flynn. As an example, 68 Thompson, which started with an SFI of 0 0.7, was reduced to 0 0.68 in discussions with the council's office, and further reduced to 0 0.66 in meetings with the community. A development at 31 Thompson with an FSI of 0 0.61 is a good example of a reasonable application which, like most others in this area, met no opposition. The applicant saw firsthand how the negotiation process works when they attended the meeting at, uh, with number 68 and the community. The applicant held a one minute, uh, sorry, a phone call via Zoom with minutes uh, with neighbors within a one minute walk of their house. Neighbors did express concern, but it was quite obvious that the applicant was not interested in making any changes. This is exactly the same situation that the city planner faced, and she had a similar lack of success in trying to get the applicant to reconsider their plans, which was unfortunate because they often broke up compromise uh, solutions. And the applicant did have from October the 9th to the 21st to try and take advantage of that, but failed to do so. With regards to just three of the comments that Mr. Flynn made, I think it's a total red herring, this measurement of 500 meters and 1,000 meters and 600 decisions. I, I just, I don't know where he gets that geography from. Um, the Toker area only has 330 homes. So his 600 and something plus decisions means every home has had two decisions. It, this is, has to be ridiculous. If Mr. Flynn disagreed with the notice. I believe he should have tried to correct it. He knows all the senior staff in the city. He shouldn't be trying to debate this at committee. And I think to put you in the middle of this discussion is, is unreasonable. Mr. Flynn simply doesn't like planning's decision. He doesn't like the decision from the councillor, and I don't think he likes the input from the community. So in a nutshell, um, I would ask the committee to decline this um, particular application. I do think it's unreasonable. And you've heard lots of numbers, and I'm certainly not going to repeat them because I'm already at five minutes and five seconds. So I won't take any more of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Okay, uh, Mr. Flynn, if you can uh, give you five minutes to respond to uh, the neighbor's concerns. I find it interesting that Mr. Green would discount the support letters in favor of this project, and yet his letters of uh, objection have value. The anyway, other issue we, the, is the committee. The committee the can go through the letters and the make, letter, their own, make their own. Uh, uh, you know whether it's a form uh, letter. Or, form you know letter. there were a lot of uh, the opposition letters. You often you see you know people write the same letter because they don't want to be hear people actually both in support and objection. Uh, you know went to the trouble of doing this, and I think to spend any more time on that, the committee, you know has a map and they know they've seen a lot of opposition letters and they can gauge who's most affected and who's least less affected and you know the the wider neighborhood versus the more specific street so it's all sort of relevant but let's let's move on on that we have the letters we have to the make their own uh, assessment on those letters obviously this is an important obviously application, an important to, a application to a lot of people uh, yes it always is Thompson Orchard is a very uh, tight neighborhood and they are to be commended that way 
So getting back to the other thing, okay, so 693 approved applications are within 1,000 meters. That includes Thompson Orchard and some other properties. It also includes the uh, Cosmo Road. Cosmo Road is part of the geographical Thompson Orchard area. And they can argue that that doesn't count, but the reality is that, that those four houses and many more have received approvals from the committee. The chart that I gave you is based on the portal, the research portal from Committee of Adjustment. Those uh, approvals are documented. So whether or not they directly are in Thompson, they are the surrounding community, and in let's not even talk about okay. About it. Okay. Whether whether it's the wider you know the wider neighborhood, the immediate neighborhood, it's all relevant, and the the, the committee members attach whatever the weight they feel is required in terms of the immediate versus the other ones. We don't have to have this discussion of what's included in. Uh, in this particular neighborhood uh, or not. Let's, let's talk about the merits of the specific application with the time you have left, rather than focusing, rather than on, focusing uh, on, you know, this isn't the US election here in terms of figuring out what. It was just, we have the application, we know the wider context and the more immediate context, and we've heard concerns and we have support. So that's where we are. Minor variance in the, the, the Gaspers decision. The Gaspers was uh, a hot potato for a whole bunch of you. It went to committee, it went to the OMB, the OMB sent it, or sorry, somebody took it to divisional court. Divisional court sent it back to the OMB with the instruction to define the term, not the word, the term minor variance. So the OMB defined minor variance as a combination of size and impact. And where there was no impact, size didn't matter. That's effectively what the OMB said. So in this case, we have just heard a lot of discussion about impact, but nobody said what the impact was. And they should try to um, identify the impact if they are going to Mr. Flynn, so Mr. Flynn, Mr. Flynn, we know the impact. Know the impact they're saying it's it's too big. It's it's too big for the lot. It's the massing. You know whether someone says, "Yeah, my window." You know, they're saying this house is inappropriate, and the variances aren't minor. So you have to show us how it, show us is, how appropriate it is appropriate and how it is minor. These so my variances. argument is, and you have the argument is that there's yeah. no. Am I allowed to speak or no? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good. Well, my argument is that there is no impact. Okay. Okay. So they say it's massing. What's the massing? It's a two-story house. It's not a three-story house. It doesn't have a length variance. It has a very modest height variance. Front yard setback is correct and in keeping with the bylaw. And the Requested approvals are in keeping with other approvals in the neighborhood, and there are a significant number of them. Okay. So this whole neighborhood is under redevelopment and reinvestment. And the argument that this magical bylaw that they had created in 1992 has some value, I would argue it doesn't, because it's been varied from so many times. I said the same thing 10 years ago. I've been working in the Tokyo neighborhood for at least 10 years, and almost all approvals, all applications have been approved because the bylaw is draconian and shouldn't be uh, enforced. There should be a new bylaw, and I've told the members of Tokyo this before, that they should go to the councillor and have the bylaw rewritten to be more... Uh, friendly to property owners, keeping in mind that these are all private property. So, you know, they have managed to... Mr. Flynn, you're at seven minutes. Please seven wrap minutes. up. Please wrap up. <laughs> well, it wasn't all me in seven. <laughs> but at any rate, okay, so my point is that it does meet the four tests, that it is appropriate, and 
we would ask you to approve. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any final follow-up questions for either any of the neighbors, Mr. Flynn, staff, or are we ready for a motion? I have uh, a few questions of the uh, people in the polls. I don't know who would be representing them. Why don't you state your question and they can, someone can okay. weigh in or yes. something. Can for a neighbor. Uh, I've heard a lot of people here, including the applicant, complaining that people aren't talking to each other, like planning isn't talking to the applicant. But I also heard that the community was not consulted. So I would like to know from the community a little bit more, did they ever meet with the applicant or was it always the applicant representative and was there any community involvement in the development of this design and discussion beyond what I've heard so far? Okay, perhaps Mr. Green uh, or Mr. Schofield is the closest neighbor uh, here for us can just quickly answer that. I don't know how germane that, but just have there, was there consultation or was there no consultation? Paul, as far as Paul you know, Schofield, with you. Can I be heard? Mr. Schofield? Yes, sorry, as long as I'm, um, yeah, if I can address that, please. Um, the first wind we got quickly that they were making any plans to do something to their house is when 39 Thompson, the property immediately to the north, uh, which was being rebuilt and had a massive SSI request. And we had a community meeting to try and discuss the concerns. And uh, we were advised at that time that, you know, they were concerned of getting involved with that because they were going to do their own build. Mm -hmm. Fine. We never heard anything, never heard anything. Uh, they never, certainly from my perspective and the people on the phone and, uh, you know, Robin Linda Schul across the street who, uh, you, you heard from indirectly through Beirut Day. Um, they never came to our door. They never organized the meeting until I think it was October 23rd when they sent out an invite to have a meeting with the neighbors within a one minute walking distance uh, of their house and specifically excluded Toka from that meeting in their email invite. We had that meeting and the, we expressed our concerns and they tried to use it as a platform to support their their request. Uh, we tried to express to them it's a new build. They were disputing that, et cetera. Uh, later in my discussions with city planning, I, had, I also was advised that they had reached out to the applicant's agent. Uh, I don't think it was Mr. Flynn at the time and they uh, did not get a response until approximately October 23rd-ish and the applicant uh, or their agent uh, wanted to come to city planning and present why this was a good uh, development for the property and not did not want to discuss the property. Okay. Uh, so, other than that, yeah. uh, there's been Thank no, you. sorry for the long winded answer, there's yeah. been no, okay. no consultation. I think, I think you've, answered, you've answered my question and my question was basically the applicant knew that he was dealing with a very active community. It's very concerned about future development and precedent setting, et cetera, et cetera. And it seemed that uh, there wasn't enough consultation from what I hear. So thank you for that answer. Okay. I would agree. Yes. Okay. Um, any other questions for either the applicant or the neighbors or someone will can we take this into committee for a decision? We've been at this for over half an hour or longer. And I think it's we gotta get to this. So we've uh, heard from a lot of people. Heard from the neighbors. We heard from Mr. Flynn twice. And uh, what we have, what's before us, is before us. So is someone ready to weigh in with a motion? If no one else is ready, I would like to weigh in with a motion. Go ahead, Mr. I Bissell. find I find uh, that the variance number two, which is basically the variance that's the meat of the heart here, and heart of the meat in, in terms of the. Uh, the nature of the project, uh, excessive um, and in terms of numbers. And I would uh, accept uh, both the councillor's recommendation and planning's recommendation that variance number two um, not be approved. So what I would the, What about the balance of the application? The side well, I, I think I could, I, I don't think those are, are gonna help anything. Yeah. I, I think that the community is really worried about number two, uh, so is anyone else. And, the applicant can stay with those other ones and work with them if they can. 
uh, or come back, but I would move uh, refusal of uh, rec rec uh, variance number two. Okay, so I, I take it with a re refusal, he's at 0.45 rather than the reduction, so he's it's basically the same thing as rejecting the whole application because uh, he, unless, Madam Secretary Chair, could the applicant come back and say, I have all the other variances and then just come with an application to bring it to, so say, everything else but 0.68? Because I've heard other con other concerns here other than the even though community planning is just focusing on that, but could the applicant come back and say, okay, I have the other four variances, well, and now I'm just experience. coming back for a variance, keeping those four variances and reducing the FSI to 0.68 or 0.62 or anything else but more than 0.45. That's my concern is that the neighbors have other concerns and perhaps it's more appropriate to reject the entire application and not just pick out variance number two for that reason. So, Mr. Bellissimo, is your motion to refuse the entire proposal or just variance number two and approve variances one, three, four, and five? No, I think my motion is to refuse number two because I think that's the issue here. The issue okay, is. Okay, so are you approving three, one, three, four, and five? That's I'm going with planning's recommendation, and I'm going with the council's uh, suggestion that number two be refused. I know, but your motion has to include yeah, his what you're motion, approving. Madam, to. Madam Secretary Treasurer, his motion is just to deny variance number two. So I just brought up a point that I need to know from staff if that is the motion that goes through. Does the applicant have his other four variances approved, subject to appeal, obviously, and then he could just come back with those four variances and with the lower FSI and come back for a fresh application that he got those other four. Because in that case, even though community planning and the councillor piggybacking just recommended refusal of variance number two, from what I'm hearing from the community and the overwhelming objection, I don't believe that that is uh, the appropriate thing to do here. But in, that, in this instance, because we've heard concerns with the setbacks in particular, and the other gross floor area as opposed to the, the gross floor area is also excessive, we've heard. So that's my suggestion. Mr. Belisso is entitled to his own motion and we'll, we'll see if other members want to support that. Can hey, someone can stop? You? There's some, someone's moving around something or breathing. It's very disconcerting. I think it's Danny. Um, so, so what I'm suggesting is, before anyone seconds that motion, I just wanted to bring up as chair, the issue is that that may not be uh, something that we want to do because if, we, if we're if we concerned with the entire application, to just pick out variance number two, I ask actually the GFA is included in that or it's? Yes. Okay, so the two of them are together. But we've also heard about the side yards and we have the height. So I'm just saying from what I've heard from the community, we should consider that, and Mr. Blissimo can can do what, can make his motion, and uh, that, that's just my caveat that it could be an issue of doing that. It's always cleaner to deal with the application on the whole, because then it's subject to redesign, and you never know what yeah. could result from those redesigned plans. But okay. in the motion from Mr. Bellissimo, yeah. okay. I do need to hear. He said twice that he's refusing variance number two. And approving if he's approving the other ones, yeah. I need to hear that. That's what he said. So let's vote on that. And Mr. Bellissimo, that's what you're saying. You're just rejecting variance number two, and you're seeking to approve the application. I will right? repeat it again. I, I'm going with the recommendation from planning, which is only to refuse number two. Thank you. Um, but what I, are you I approving? I want to know well, what I, you're I, approving. Well, obviously, the other ones get approved. I know, but see, yeah, we needed to hear planning, you say that. Okay, he said it. Yes, uh, plan, planning, planning is saying the same motion. thing, so I'm going by what planning is saying. Only refuse number two. You don't just have to do what planning says. Okay, is there a seconder to that motion? Is there a seconder for Mr. Bellissimo's motion? No seconder? Okay, the motion fails. Do I have another motion? Um, I'm going to move for refusal of the entire application. 
Um, I think planning staff have looked at everything. They specifically looked at uh, the, the FSI and GFA, but I'm afraid what could come in if we um, approve variances that aren't tied to a certain site plan uh, that staff haven't looked at. Uh, we don't know what, and, and, and the public have not looked at. So I think we have to look at the application in its entirety. And I don't think the variances requested are minor in uh, this application. Uh, they're not minor, they're not desirable. So I'm going to move for refusal of all of the variances requested. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. We have a seconder for that motion. I'll second it. You can't call you because you can't have a tie because I'm, I don't know why we don't have five members and only four, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone. Um, well, it seems like maybe if Mr. Blissimo sticks with his wanting to re just reject variance two and perhaps Mr. Taylor is thinking in terms of approval, then we wouldn't have a tie. We not, might not have a tie. So let's just see how it how it bears out. Someone may change. We have a we have an. Um, okay, I'm just. I recognize that there is a motion that's been seconded on the table. The chair is not supposed to vote to cause a okay. tie. If we have a vote now and there it results in a tie, this will have to be deferred so that there's a five member panel. Okay. So all in favor of that motion. So we have a tie. So Mr. Bellissimo is not in favor of that motion. He just wants to reject the one. He'd, he'd like to give them their side yards and all of those other the heights without, without having it tied to a site plan. You're prepared to just reject that. I assume Mr. Taylor maybe is in favor. So that's that issue. So. All opposed to that motion. You're opposed. Are you opposed? You might. Oh, no, this motion. You're opposed. Right. To so this. opposed to this yeah. motion. Mr. Danny, Taylor's are you opposed to, to this motion? <laughs> yes. Okay. So this application has been deferred until we can get a full five-member panel, and I don't know when that will be. Wow. So I'm just looking at the staff report. I'm not trying to convince anyone, but they certainly had uh, building scale not compatible. I'm just concerned because we've heard from the neighbors, and I'm, I, if it is a new build, they shouldn't get those side yards. They should, may, may get the height, but they may not get the height. And I, I agree with Mr. Palmer that we're not, we should, if we don't have those variances tied to a drawing, it's, we're, we're in dangerous territory in, in agreeing to those side yards on a new build. And I believe the neighbors were against that. And I, if the, if to me, if the GFA is inappropriate, then so is the side yard setbacks. But I assume Mr. Blissmo wanted to give that to them. Mr. Taylor was very clear he wanted to. He was in favor of approval of the application. Mr. Blissmo was more or less against variance two, in which case the entire application would fail anyway. But now he's not willing to join that. So the motion fails and we'll have to defer until we have a full panel. Quite what disappointing for all question. these. Question. Um, if it's deferred, then the applicant has an opportunity to bring back a revision for consideration. Yeah, well that would be a good thing because then perhaps Mr. Flynn, hearing what he hears, can maybe be try to work out something that's more acceptable to the neighborhood rather than getting, uh, perhaps on a five panel, maybe he's gonna get approved. Mr. Taylor was in favor. Mr. Bellissima was just in, fa was in favor of everything but the uh, variance number two because as per the planning report and the uh, and staff. So that will happen and will mean in the meantime, maybe as a practical matter, uh, there can be changes made. Who's, who's shuffling papers or breathing there? Danny, can you please, let's see if it's you. Can you please mute yourself? Me, I'm not touching anything. I don't, I know, but it still could be just, can you mute yourself and we'll know if it's you? Yeah, it was you. 
Doesn't mean if you're touching anything, but it's picking up either your breathing or something. So please stay muted for a while, okay? While we discuss this, if you're not speaking, because it's very disconcerting. Okay, so I motion fails to, and the matter is deferred. To. And Mr. Flynn and, and the leaders of the, of the neighbors, perhaps you can use this time and this anomaly of not having it approved after spending 45 minutes to use that time constructively to come up with something that's acceptable to, uh, to the neighborhood. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now move on to the next application. Item number 24, one e Eltham Drive. This is an application for a new detached garage. There are four variances. We have a covering letter and photos. We have a, a petition and support, 17 uh, planning. We have a planning report for information and Councillor Grimes agrees with that as well. And um, we're being advised that the lands, there's a landscape variance, but it, that it's technical in nature. And transportation has no objection. So I think that introduces the application. The reason we introduced the application is just to know we used to have briefings, and in the virtual world, we no longer have briefings. So I always find, and I believe other chairs have copied the same, is to give an introduction of the application at the outset. Uh, we only have one registered speaker, Mr. Scott Wilson, the agent. Mr. Wilson, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, um, basically, you're the uh, committee members. Would you do you require a presentation from Mr. Uh, from the agent, Mr. Wilson? No. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, we've heard about the landscape variance. Uh, okay, would you, is there anything you'd like to add before we take it into committee? I don't think we need a presentation. And uh, no one has any questions? Okay, so Mr. Wilson, if there's nothing, anything you'd like to add, otherwise we'll take it into committee for a decision. No, there's nothing we'd like to add. Okay, thank you. We have the, the planning report for information. Mr. Bellissimo would like to make a motion. Yes, sir. I find that the uh, variances are minor in nature, especially the soft landscaping. When I look at the entire site, there's a lot of landscaping still provided. So I'd like to move approval of the variances. Okay, the seconder for Mr. Bellissimo's motion. Mr. Palmer, there's no conditions. Okay, all in favor. Unanimous approval. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, committee. Next application is item number 25, 64, the Kingsway. It's an application to construct a two-story rear addition and a partial third floor addition. There are four variances. And we have a submission from the applicant. Number 62 is opposed. Um, we have a letter that they're uh, too close and uh, issues of sunlight. And other than the applicant submission and that uh, opposition letter, that's all we have. And uh, registered to speak is Franco Romano, the agent, and uh, Nadia Sakno from 62, the Kingsway, right next door. Mr. Romano. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to refer to the presentation material that I submitted. Yep. Um, I think this illustrates the building additions that are proposed in the context. So this is... This is a proposal that involves um, a rear two-story addition and a partial third floor addition. So more than 50% of the walls are being maintained. And the proposal, as you will see at the front elevation, that, that front gable and Tudor style uh, it, that it currently exists is just being uh, maintained and improved upon to the rear and to the uh east and what you all as well as to the west so what i have in green text it's showing basically where the existing is to remain 
and it blue text the roof and dormer that is to be constructed in you. So the part of the building is being chopped and new construction is occurring. When we go to the east elevation, which is at the bottom of this page, thank you kindly, you're navigating this quite nicely for me, I appreciate it. What you're gonna see along the side elevation and the east and the west are very similar is on the right hand side, there is in green text, the existing to remain. And you'll see that it, that is in a gable form with a chimney that runs through the center of it. Mm -hmm. And then on the left hand side in blue, there is a, a corresponding gable that is proposed. So those are the portions that are at the uh, 0.45 meter east side yard setback mm -hmm. and everything else beyond it moves away from the property line so it's built within the roof line and you'll see that there's actually peaks and valleys that allow for more light penetration to occur as the sun goes towards the west because this is uh one of the issues that i believe the neighbor to the to the east had, had indicated so in terms of the actual building itself, the, only the first floor, and you see this on the site plan drawing, only the first floor is at the 17.75 meters. And that's from that front gable portion to the rear wall. Then the second floor is at 13.8 meters. And the third floor is at 8.6 meters. So it is a, an articulated footprint and it's an articulated mass. So then there's the, most of what is occurring in terms of new floor area is within the central portion of the building and articulated so then it isn't pushed out to the sides like we typically see in a more conventional design where you have the side walls, the front and the rear walls going straight up. There is, the, and you'll see also in the roof line that there are dormers that are being provided. So there's no, uh, in my opinion, there's no significant impact that occurs on the neighboring properties. You'll see on the site on the site plan that uh, yes, the building is going to be longer uh, than what currently exists, but this angled portion of the Kingsway means that that neighboring property to the east uh, is built basically mostly at the central and rear portion of the lot. That's what you see on their site plan. They are not built towards the front of the lot as one would normally see on a, on a streetscape. And so if it, if that easterly neighbor were actually built where it would line up with the front yard setback of the neighbor of, of the subject site, these buildings would be pretty much in line with one another and very similar to one another. But there, there is a situation here where one needs to expect that there's going to be some exposure and some um in terms of the side yard setback that's being proposed that it's being mitigated with the with the step backs and the articulated roof line so i would submit that what is being proposed here in terms of lot coverage 8.9 square meter difference is uh is definitely minor the floor space index is being requested the, the proposal is adding about 200 square meters in floor area, and that includes some of the knee walls and that dormer. So that is also in keeping with what we see in the in the neighborhood for new generation, either new construction or building additions. And, and the side yard setbacks are existing, and I believe I've, I've uh, described how those relate to the proposal as well as the building length. So I would submit that the proposal is a sensitive design and has no unacceptable adverse impact. So you've read the letter from uh, the neighbor uh, next door at, uh, and what she's saying about this. First of all, she doesn't, isn't aware of what you just explained to us other than just listening. You didn't never met with her. Your client never met with her in terms of uh, explaining okay. to us about the setbacks. The, the owner did uh, meet with her or tried to discuss with her, but okay. there is no resolution there. Okay. Very good. Let's uh, let's hear from you. You'll have obviously a chance to respond to her concerns. And we have Thank you. Letter. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nadia Sakno. Yes. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Uh, well, my concern is uh, I'm living in a hundred year old house. My windows are wooden. My doors are wooden. 
So the house that they're proposing uh, addition is very close to my house. I'm living in a homesmith's house and it's uh, unique. I would love to preserve it. I'm living with a four small children. And to me, it's very important that if in case of fire, where are they gonna escape? If they can't escape in the front door, the back door is gonna be blocked by the new addition. And the other thing is the sun is on the west. And my dining room over there, you can see the picture, the window is sticking out. It's actually my dining room. And next to it, there is a family room and piano room. So my, my four children playing piano every day and we eat lunch and breakfast and dinner in the dining room. As soon as they build three story house right, right next to mine, they, my children are gonna be like in the basement sitting every day, eating lunch, dinner, and breakfast in a very dark, dark house. It's a three story and it's way too close. That's why the bylaw exists. So they should be obeying bylaw. And um, what else I wanted to say, uh, it would devalue my property because it would be so close to the, to the house. And my concern is his exhaust pipes. Will they come to my windows, you know, from the furnace? Okay. That's, I guess. All that I wanted to say that my main concern is in case of fire and the sun, sunlight for my children. You probably wouldn't want your children to be in a room dark all the time. And if you look at my windows, they all Tudor windows. Like they're not huge big windows. If there's a house next door built right next to those windows, it's uh, it, there's no sunlight mm -hmm. because my house is from the east. And their house is going to be uh, in the west. That's when sun goes down. That's and it, even if they say three stories not too high, because the sun goes down, it's going down, right? So it, it's going to be behind their house. Yeah. And okay. I think there's no need to be that close. Like my opinion, the, the the house they're proposing is like twice bigger. There's only three people there: husband and wife and a small child. They don't need that huge house. They can move those one meter because that's what it is. One meter move. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions for the neighbor before we go back to Mr. Romano for a reply? Okay, Mr. Romano. So the side yard setback <coughs> Uh, is what's of concern to the neighbor at 62, as you know. Yes, which is uh, the the existing east side yard setback is being uh, maintained and built with their second story addition at the back. So, so the and that obviously affects the interior layout if it were to be constructed uh, in compliance with the bylaw, which would be the 1.2 meters. So again, the way that the proposal mitigates the side yard setback condition is through that articulated mass as one rises. And you see that on that uh, supporting document where you just have the gable and the gable slopes front to back. So there's not a lot of 0 0.45 meters that is new that is up against that uh, on that east wall and that's the the lower the lower graphic yes the east side elevation so that's how it's mitigated and everything else in between that valley in between the two gables actually allows light penetration to occur the the uh in the backyard which is on the left hand side of this of this drawing so the back no 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 sorry on this elevation i'm not looking to uh, to move from this east elevation thank you so the gables, you know, we have the valley in between the two gables, and then on the left-hand side, the left gable also slopes from the top down. So that also allows light penetration. So that's how the, the sunlight is being maximized with this addition, keeping in mind that all what's being done is being is building to the 0 0.45 meters that currently exists. In terms of separation, there's actually uh, over 2.15 meters between this, the existing building, proposed building addition, and then and the dwelling to the east. So that's ample space. So there is no there is no fire issue. There is no uh, exit issue for the neighbor because the proposal is just 
constructing on its own property. There is no construction that's being proposed on the neighboring property that would affect their ability to in egress and ingress their existing doors, et cetera. And also in terms of the sunlight and the issue of the side yard setback, the building height is less than what the bylaw allows. The bylaw allows 9.5 meters. And this, one again, the way that this floor area is being deployed is you're basically using roof space as habitable space, but it is less than 9.5 meters. It is at 9.06 meters, and that's to the ridge. So where is that located on nearest to the, the east side lot line? It's at the top of the gables. So again, there's a mitigation that's being introduced here that is, in my opinion, uh, creating less impact than what could be constructed as of right, even if you had the, well, two things. One, the existing side yard setback is allowed to be built upon. So I can go to 9.5 meters up with the existing east side yard setback of 0 0.45 meters and not trigger a variance. Or two, we can build a house that's a box at 1.2 meters up to 9.5 meters with wall heights that are taller than what is being proposed here. So I believe that the proposal is quite sensitive and it fits in with the neighboring context and is appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Romano. Is there is this an appropriate given your explanation? Sorry, there was, there was one other item. Uh, the mechanical that currently exists is not being relocated. It is on the west side of the building in the basement. So there is no new mechanical that's going to be introduced and certainly not on the east side of the building. Okay. Sorry. Uh, given your explanation, Mr. Romano, would this be an appropriate situation to have the approval tied to a plan for the protection of the neighbor to make sure that whatever you're getting on the side yards and the height and everything else you explained, it's articulated and it's not across the whole thing, that perhaps it should be tied to uh, a plan uh, to keep your client honest on that? And if so, what drawing would that be? Assuming community members saw fit to, in this circumstance, given your explanation to tie it to a plan. Yes, sir. I think it would be appropriate to tie it uh, to the site plan drawing and the building elevations on file with the committee of adjustment. And uh, perhaps the secretary treasurer or the staff can confirm the date that that was received because I don't have it handy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's open it up to see if there's any remaining follow-up questions from committee members for either you or the neighbor or if we're ready to take it into committee for a, uh, a motion and a decision. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned with the 0.45 meter setback, uh, side yard setback. That's not a lot of uh, room for maintenance of the side of that house. I know it's matching what's presently existing, um, but I'm, I'm really concerned with uh, continuing that side yard setback at such a a small dimension. Is that is a question for him or? Well, it's just a statement. Yeah, statement. Okay. So we're taking, if there's no more questions, then let's take it in and we can have those type of comments. Uh, assuming, so all the questions are done, right? No more questions. Okay, so we're in committee. So you have concern with the setback. Of five, five on the other one. Danny, I see you've just unmuted you yourself. Are you prepared to have something to weigh in with? Well, I, I, I am, but I thought that would be bothering you guys again. <laughs> Sorry for the joke. Um, sometimes it's hard to understand what's going on here. Uh, no, if there's no one else talking, I, I would definitely like to weigh in. Uh, I find uh, that this uh, building is not a house, it's a sculpture. Um, I'm very fascinated with the gables up and down in the peaks and the valleys and how sensitive this design is to, I think, to the neighbor and to the history of the existing house. Um, so I would be glad to move a, a approval of the recommendations and take your suggestion, Mr. Chair, that we tie it to the site plan and to the elevations as submitted at this meeting. I'm assuming that's adequate, if the staff can weigh in on that. Uh, we have certain elevations in front of us and they're all dated. So whatever those dates whatever are. Date stamp usually. 
We only have one set of plans on file, so, so just the plans on that's file. That's the one, okay. Okay, thank you okay. for that motion, Mr. Bellissimo. We have a seconder for that motion. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. All in favor? You have unanimous Thank approval, Mr. Romano. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Romano. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you uh, to the neighbor. And uh, we'll move on. Next application is item number 26, uh, 18 Aberlady Road. We have one speaker, Jim Gerard, the agent. So we have no opposition. Uh, this is an application to convert the attached garage to habitable space. Transportation has no objection, and that's all we have. No, uh, no communication from neighbors or from other city departments other than transportation. And the agent is, as I stated, Jim Gerard. Mr. Gerard? Yes, hello. It's uh, Jim Gerard. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. So this is... Um, you're just converting the garage to habitable space. That that is correct. Yes, our yeah. client has some um, uh, accessibility issues that requires some long term care, and they're looking to uh, just convert the garage so it makes a little bit more habitable space on the main floor for their for their usage. And transportation is okay. That you're going to then not park in the garage, but park in the front yard, and they're okay with that. So they've waited. That, that's correct. Okay. Any questions for uh, Mr. Gerard? Are we ready for a motion? I'd like to uh, make a motion if no one else has any other questions. Okay. I find that the uh, proposal does not impact on the massing or bulk nature of the site and uh, people park their cars out front and driveways all the time. So I have no issues with that. I approve, uh, I, I move approval for the recommendations before us today. Thank you, Mr. So Mr. Right. Seconder Thank for you. that. Yes. Okay, all in favor? Unanimous approval, Mr. Gerard. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Uh, item number 27 is 4 Snowden Street. Uh, this is an application to construct a new attached garage with a second story addition and a new covered front porch. Um, we have two variances. Uh, Toronto Regional Conservation Authority has no objection and transportation has no objection. And that's all we have. And we have registered as the speaker, Francesco Siginardo, who's the owner of the property. And he will be pres presenting his, uh, Mr. Siginardo, are you with us? Oh, yes, I am. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, we have a couple Hello. of sketches refer in reference. We have the Long Branch Character Guidelines uh, we have, no, I'm uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong application. I'm sorry. Uh, that was number 28, number 27, 27. We just have the TRCA communications together with what you submitted. Um, I don't believe we need a presentation. Committee members have any questions about this, uh, this addition? The new attached garage with the addition above. And if not, is someone ready to uh, make a motion on this? Mr. Chair, I find the uh, requested variances address the four tests under the Planning Act. And I move for approval without conditions. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Seconded for Mr. Taylor's motion. Mr. Uh, Oh. All in favor? You have your approval. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. Okay. Okay, this was the one I was referring to by mistake. Item 28, 2931st Street. Uh, this is uh, an application for a detached dwelling with an attached garage with four variances. We have the Long Branch Guidelines. We have support and opposition. 31 is in support, advising the property's been vacant for seven years and unkempt. Um, 
and planning is is weighing in that they would like this either deferred and if not deferred they would like it refused I believe we've heard from staff that the applicant or agent is in, is a, willing to agree to a deferral uh, we do have registered as speakers the agent uh, is Ida Evangelista who I assume is with us and we have several uh, eight several other people registered I don't know if they're still still with us 34 31st Street, 31 31st Street, 21 Birchley, 27 31st Street, and then uh, Christine Mercado representing the Long Branch Neighborhood Association. So I assume everyone's with us. Um, let's first, we'll have to first deal with the issue of the deferral request by community planning. Mrs. Evangelist, are you with us? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I'm Evangelista on behalf of the owners of 29 31st Street. Um, I would like to put forward a deferral to allow us the opportunity to, um, to meet with planning and make some changes to the application. Um, I did, I, I do, however, I would like to mention that I did personally hand out packages to the area residents to allow an opportunity to have a conversation with them to discuss the application as it is because you know, we were willing to remove the length variance, you know, adjust the side yard setback, which would have brought down the, the okay. SSI. Yeah, we, you know, we don't have to get into and, the merits now, I, Mrs. Evangelista. No and now I would like to defer it. Yeah, okay, because the community planning was suggesting that, and they said the reason is to provide you the opportunity to submit the Long Branch Character Guidelines Checklist uh, to the satisfaction of Director Community Planning and identifying compliance with the Long Branch neighbor characteristics as well as to modify the proposal to be more in keeping. So that will give you that uh, ability to do that and that was planning's recommendation with you which you're uh, agreeing to and we'll have to obviously canvas the other people uh, uh, before us and you have perhaps you can arrange some kind of a meeting once you do make the changes and complete the guideline. Um, so perhaps we should um, we, and first of all, I guess we could can hear from uh, Christine Mercado for the Long Branch Association on this issue of the deferral. We're only talking about the deferral now. Ms. Mercado, uh, are you hello. with us? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. I'm still here. Um, as far as I, I have spoken with the neighbors um, that are here today, and we are all in agreement that uh, we do support planning's position of a deferral, um, and if not a deferral, then a refusal. Um, pretty much I've, I've read everyone's presentation and our concerns are generally in line with what planning's concerns are and that it's just too big. So if they would, if the applicant would be, um, would want to make the FSI smaller and make it more in character with the guidelines, I, I think, I think a deferral would be, would be well used. Okay. Both to complete the, your, the character guideline and to discuss some changes that may be acceptable and perhaps you can coordinate that with uh, Mrs. Evangelista in terms of the, uh, the neighbors. Uh, so do we have to weigh in and get each of these people's position on the deferral or can you just speak on their behalf? I see we uh, have- I can, I'm comfortable in speaking on their behalf. Yeah, I see we have both adjacent neighbors, Sandra Tully and Louise Blazik. But if you can, we don't have to canvas them all and you know, it looks like- uh, uh, You know what, uh, sorry, Mr. sorry to interrupt Mr. Chair. Um, I, can't, I can't speak to the neighbor of the North. I haven't spoken to her directly. So perhaps you would want to weigh in. Like we are all in agreement that something should be developed. We're just not in agreement with what, what we're not in agreement with the application. Okay. Well, you can work with Mrs. Evangelista. She's uh, sure you've worked with her before. So um, should we canvas all the other people? I guess, you know, it, it's gonna be, it's community planning's request. Uh, Mrs. Evangelista is in favor on behalf of the applicant and Christine Mercado on behalf of the Long Branch Association. So the neighbors only have any something to gain by this. So I don't think we have to canvas them. So uh, on the motion, on the issue of the deferral, can I uh, get a motion? I'd like to uh, make a motion uh, for deferral uh, on the understanding that the applicant will be consulting with the local uh, community. Okay, and we'll be completing the, it's the, the two, uh, yeah, it's set out in the planning report as the purpose. Okay, seconder for Mr. Bellissimo. I think Mr. Kaler was about to make a motion, so I'll take him as the as the seconder. All in favor? 
Okay, the matter's been deferred. Thank you. And just to be consistent with what I've told applicants in the morning session, uh, anything that's being deferred today at the request of the applicants is not going to be heard until February 2021 at the earliest. Okay, so like we say to everyone at the end of these, Happy New Year. <laughs> okay, number 29 is Five Hatton Court. Uh, this is an application for a second story addition above the existing dwelling and a new covered front porch. And there are five variances. And I believe all we have, we have copy of the bylaw. Yeah, and we just have ravines. And the applicant on this application is Curtis Van Coolen from Hughes Design Studio on behalf of the, uh, as the agent. And we have the neighbor at Six Hatton Court uh, as well. Good afternoon, uh, committee members and Mr. Chair. Hello. Okay, uh, I see we have a neighbor. Have you spoken to the neighbors or do you know uh, the neighbor at number six, what their concern is? No, I do not. Uh, I do know that the owners did uh, speak to a couple of the neighbors. I'm not sure if they were included in that, so I'm not too sure on what their concerns are. Yeah, maybe they may have, I don't know, spoken to the adjacent and the ones behind, but maybe not the one in front. Um, mm -hmm. This is for a second story. Okay, so the, they're, they're across the street, it looks like. So perhaps why don't we hear from them first and you'll have a chance to respond. Unless committee members have any questions at the outset before we hear from the neighbor? Or do you suggest we can hear from the neighbor and then go back? I've got a, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm looking to st for staff help here. Variance one, I don't understand the uh, first sentence about maximum GFA. <clears throat> It says up to a maximum FSI of 0 0.50 meters squared. Staff. I could explain if uh, staff is not available. Staff. Yep. Yeah, it's worded a little differently than we normally do. The very. So it's 150 square meters plus 25% of the lot area up to a maximum of 0.5. Oh, sorry, I do know this. Um, <laughs> Because in, in ravine lots, only the table land is considered as buildable area. So only the flat portion of the land is considered as lot area. In this case, the entire lot has no table land area due to the slope. So zoning has identified that they're allowed zero square meters. We did double check this before it went out. Because it's not table end. Yeah, the. Yeah. I could expand on that if members would allow. Sure, go ahead. It's your application, so you tell us whatever sure. you want. <laughs> so we were uh, going through uh, an application with the TRCA, obviously, um, and dealing with them. They've established a top of bank at the very back of the property. Um, the top of bank then slopes down to the backyard of this property. And when it's, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a um, technicality due to the fact that the table is established behind the property and that the table then everything below is established as not buildable based on what the, the way that TRCA has uh, looked at it. So because it is behind and because the house is below, they basically said anything below the top of bank and that's the wording that they used and that's the wording in the regulation, anything below a top of bank. Um, but it doesn't speak to, you know, at the bottom of the slope, then obviously there are a number of structures at the bottom of this slope. Uh, and then that's where it comes into play where, you know, because it says anything below the top of bank, it doesn't also say anything beyond the toe of slope, if you know what I'm trying to say. So um, just because of the way that it's written on the TRCA side, that's why we're, we're in front of you with this confusing minor variance. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, any other further que questions for the, uh, the, the agent before we go on to the neighbor and he'll have a chance to respond to that. So you've been working, it looks like, uh, back and forth with TRCA on this. Correct, yeah. We have a letter from TRCA basically saying that they're not, uh, they're not opposed to it whatsoever, and uh, they, we will be having a, an approval issued from them. Okay. Okay, so let's hear from Mr. England from Six Hat and Court across the street. Mr. Chairman, uh, we did have Mr. England before uh, on the WebEx, but he has since disappeared. And I've checked through any of the new call and users, none of them match his phone number. So okay. I don't think he's with us anymore. Okay, we don't have a letter from him, but we don't really, uh know what his did um mr van Coolen, um did you know if you your client spoke to any of the neighbors or yeah i just looked up where the state says it's directly beside them and i know that they did speak to them and i asked her you know did he express any concerns to you and she said no so uh, as far as i know that you know at the time that we did approach them there was no concern yeah, from their just, part so it's next like i said that i'm trying to see on the on the location map, the, and the numbers don't come out. So it's oh, it's, it's directly next, to it's next it's door. Next door, if you're facing the yeah, if you're okay. facing the house, it's on, on the, the left. left. Yeah. Okay. Well, Correct. Perhaps I just wanted to observe. Um, in any case, any questions for uh, the agent, committee members? I could I could walk through a couple of the other variances as well, if you wish. Okay. Sure. It's a little, you know, difficult or a little different. So why don't you do that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so because we are in a TRCA regulated area, we are not expanding beyond the established footprint of the existing house. Um, first of all, we cannot on the ground floor. We cannot go out, so we have to go up. Um, the the again the complexity with the top of slope and then everything below is not considered. Uh, that that is tricky because most of the slope is not even on the property. There's just a little bit at the top at the very back of the property that goes through. Um, so the DRCA did, you know, express their regret and said just the way that their regulations are written, we fall into this technicality. And then the subsequently the zoning bylaw, the way it also considers the buildable area. Um, that's how we landed up with the first variance, and it's kind of a technicality, and it's it's really, you know, we can't really do anything other than ask for a variance on it. Um, and then again, in keeping with the next variance, you know, we're we're only developing on top again on the footprints. We're not going any closer to any sort of hazard or um, top or bottom of slope or anything like that. So number yeah, so two. So it's just a small variance. You need 10 meters from the stable top of bank and you're at 8.79 and they're supportive of that. Yeah, and, I, and again, I just wanted to stress we're not going beyond the existing footprint. And then, yeah, we have a letter from uh, Daniel at the TRCA stating that there's no objections on their behalf. On October 30th, we received that, so. Okay. Okay, let's bring it into committee and see if uh, someone's ready to make a motion. Mr. Chair, I, I find the variances to be uh, in keeping with the four tests under the Planning Act. And I would move for approval without conditions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Taylor. Seconded for Mr. Taylor's motion. Mr. Palmer, thank you. All in favor? Unanimous approval. Thank you, sir. Thank you, committee, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Next application is item 30 A, B, and C, 38 Rockcliffe Road. It's for uh, consent to sever and uh, two new, uh, two new uh, semi-detached dwellings, I believe, or the detached. It's a semi-detached. Okay, and I got to get to the right application here. Okay, uh, we have planning recommending refusal. Uh, they're basically concerned that the peers with the GFA, which comes in at 1.28 on each of the two semis, and planning, as I believe my notes say that they said they would, the maximum they would agree to is 1.08 times coverage. Uh, we have forestry and um, 
11 variances on each of the two Sorry, Mr. Chair, I just want to point out there is a report from ECS that seems to be missing from your package. Paul's just going to bring it up. Um, is that the standard? Yeah, they have no conditions? objection subject to the following conditions, just a max minimum 2% slope, maximum 4%. Mm. Notation on the drawing about the driveways. Okay, we have municipal road damage deposit, that kind of stuff. Nothing unusual. Okay, so we're planning. So, and the agent here again is Mr. Rom we don't have anyone else scheduled to speak on this other than Mr. Romano. Uh, Mr. Romano? Yes, sir. Okay, welcome back. You've seen the staff Thank report. You. They're recommending refusal. Um, due to the fact that the two semis you propose, uh, they claim it's overbuilding, 0.8 times coverage permitted, when you're coming in at 1.28 times the coverage a lot, they said 1.08 is, I read that somewhere where they would uh, agree to, and then you have uh, several other variants as well, including the plat rear platform and driveway width and a few other things. So the Very main nice. thing appears to be the GFA, if you would agree with me. There's also forestry conditions, so. Well, based on what you're telling me, sir, I would I would agree. I, I haven't I haven't seen that planning staff report. Oh, you I haven't. I can't. But no, I I can't. I have not. No, I don't. I don't see it on the AIC. At least when I checked this morning, well, it's dated it wasn't October, there. So dated October twenty first. <clears throat> Madam Secretary Treasurer. It's okay. I can I can address that issue, yeah. sir. If we can go to my okay. slides. Right. There's all kinds, you know, there's all these charts. It's actually a more comprehensive report than we normally see. They're talking about the, anyway, you can read it, but uh, planning staff are of the opinion should the proposed severance be granted, the associated variance would allow for the construction of a semi detached building is not in keeping with the general intent and purpose of the official plan and zoning bylaw. Overall staff are the opinion of proposed development and represents an overdevelopment of the site. Planning staff have discussed the concerns. This is where I was talking earlier this morning and requested the proposal be revised. The applicant advised that they wish to have the applicant considered as currently proposed. There was another application this morning where I thought that's what they were saying and they didn't, but it was this one. So they basically oh, I see. saying that they went to you and they told you and you decided you wanted to come in at the 1.28 with what's before us, not make revisions. If we can go to the slides, sir, I'll speak yep. to the FSI firstly. Mm -hmm. I have, a, I think I have a two slide presentation. <clears throat> so the proposal is in, involving a, a site that's located on the west side of Rockcliffe Boulevard. And you'll see even on the photographs that you're, we're, we're looking at, including the subject site, there's a rise in topography from front to the back. And I'm going to go to the second slide shortly, but what you're going to see in the front is that buildings that are being uh, part of the new generation of buildings includes an integral garage and then two levels of living above. And that integral garage, if you look at the first photograph in the upper left hand side, you're going to see an integral garage and then off to the left, there's a doorway. To access that dwelling with a long series of stairs leading up to the what is actually the first floor. So under today's zoning bylaw 569 2013 that integral garage portion is the first floor because it is the port the the floor level that is nearest to established grade. The floor levels above the integral garage, even though they are the first and second floor, are considered the second and third floor. So then the proposed FSI of 1.28 actually includes that lower level, and I'm gonna call that the basement level, even though it's considered the first floor under the zoning bylaw. And you're gonna see the next door neighbor Semi-detached has that condition. Mm. Up and down uh, Rockcliffe Boulevard, that condition manifests itself commonly in dwellings. And some of the dwellings, a garage is pushed forward, and still we have 
uh, first floor that is beyond that or the uh, or the basement level. If we go to the next slide, slide so, two, please. Sorry, Mr. Romanos, if I can interrupt, you were basically listening along. I guess the thing is the basement is being considered above is more above ground, so it's being counted for GFA. Is that what's happening here? That's right. Excluding yeah, correct. So excluding the basement, the excluding the basement, which yeah. um, and this is I was going to come to that point as soon as I pointed out one other thing, sir. And I'm going to okay. point out that one other thing first. Go ahead. Go ahead. On the second slide. Yes. On the on the second slide in the lower right hand corner, you're going to see the rear elevation. Mm -hmm. So where is that basement or first floor where the garage and the entrance is located at the front? It's completely underground. So the first floor above the integral garage at the front, when you walk through the building and come out into the backyard, in the backyard it's about five steps off of where the natu natural grade is. Mm. So, so that, that slopes. That, that basement, yes, it slopes from the front to the back. It slopes up. So, so that basement or first floor under the bylaw is counted as GFA. And if we don't count it as GFA, the proposal comes in at 0 0.88 FSI or, or less than what staff were saying would be acceptable at the one point in change if you're telling me if it was 1.28 or 1.08. So I think that the FSI, once we actually look at the numbers and see how they manifest themselves in terms of the building, it's actually responding to not only what's found in the character of the area, but what the grades are on the site. And if you look at the side elevation, it's on this second slide as well. Oh no, <clears throat> firstly, you'll see on my notation on that rear elevation, that the second story platform is actually a great, uh, it's a grade related platform at the back. Do you, see, do you see that? The grade related deck is a platform at the second story for the zoning interpretation. So that's why the zoning is saying the basement is floor number one, then two is where the deck is, and three is the actual, in reality, second story. So when we go to the side elevation, you're going to see that. <clears throat> you'll see that grade. And in this south elevation, you're gonna see the grade at the front is on the right-hand side. So that's where you see the steps. And the steps are, are actually not as, not as dominant or not, not as many as what you find on other dwellings. And we saw those in the photographs on my first slide. Well, you see how the grade rises? So that at the front, you've got actually a door that is that grade and then on the off to the side and then you come up and the actual door on the uh, at the on the sidewall is is kind of an, an intervening space so you come in there and then you go up some steps to get to the actual first floor so i think the fs this this is this is an all for all intents and purposes a conventional two-story dwelling it, it reads as a three third story at the front because of the slope yeah and that's where the fsi comes from everything else there's a lot here that that feeds into that same condition in terms of the uh, uh, some of the platforms that are variances. And in terms of the building height, it's actually at 9.12 meters, whereas the bylaw allows 11 meters and three stories. So I don't believe that this is an over an overdevelopment in terms of the building length. We'll see that the length actually includes the underground storage or cold room that's underneath the deck in the back. See on the left hand side of the south elevation here, I've got the note grade and under there, under the deck, it's actually excavated. Because it's excavated, it's got a foundation and it leads up to the, uh, well, it's got a foundation and that's why the, uh, the building depth and the building length is measured all the way to that portion there. So in terms of what we see on the street, the lot sizes certainly fit in. I don't see that uh, what you pointed out to me that staff had a concern with the severance itself. There's detached, semi-detached and apartment buildings on the street and the floor space index ranges from 0 0.5 to over 1.8. Those are my calculations. So the proposal, in my opinion, based on this design, and again, this is um, something that could be tied to the uh, to the drawings on on file as well. Okay. Um, 
Mr. Matt, I'm confused here. So I, I assume you didn't see this staff report. Otherwise, perhaps I'm going to ask you, why didn't you speak to the planner? Because the planner makes no mention of the fact that the lot slopes from front to back and that the basement is out of the ground in the front, and that's why they're higher FSI, and it's really not 1.28. It's one, all of that stuff. They don't mention anything yeah. about it, but they do mention at 40 next door, they're saying it's an anomaly, that it was similar design next door, but it was 40 A and B Rockcliffe of a similar design as this proposal. But they note that there's a building permit from 1991 was constructed prior to the city of Toronto amalgamation and the adoption of the Toronto official plan, et cetera, et cetera. And this one example does not represent the character. So the question is that that lot also slopes similarly. It's right next door. And why does the planner not mention that at all? Uh, because I've seen other reports where they take, they take notice of the fact that really the third floor of the basement is out of the ground, either totally or in this case just at the front. There's no mention of that whatsoever. And I, I trust, I take it you haven't oh. seen this report. They just say no, the development, the they don't they mention. Have, they may have this. They did mention next door at 40 A and B, but they're saying that's an anomaly and they won't, they, that does not represent the neighborhood um, character. Well, if we go back to my photographs, page one, slide one of my photographs, I disagree that it uh, that 40 A and B is an anomaly. Okay, but it's, what it's I'm right saying, what I'm confused floor. is they don't mention, they don't take any recognition of what you're telling us here, that the reason your FSI is so high or GFA or whatever is because your basement counts because it's out of the ground at the front and it's because of this particular slope. That's my con my confusion. When we get a planning report, we expect I, to be mentioning I something. Can't, I can't speak for her. Yeah, because that, to me, that's very I can't, relevant. I can't, it's not the first time we've seen this, <laughs> where the basement is out of the ground and it counts, and that's why the FSI is higher. We see that very, uh, very often, but they don't mention that here. They yeah. just say it hasn't been... Uh, research of immediate area shows FSI variances equal or less than 1.08 times the area of the lot. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I also want to point out there's an error on the notice for the consent if the committee's comfortable um, changing it at the hearing when you're making your decision. For the retained parcel, the lot area will not be 220.49. I believe it's 204 something. I'll get you that number. Sorry, that's... Um... It should be 204.49 square meters. As opposed to... 220 for the retained lot. So question for staff, do you feel that that is uh, something that uh, we haven't had any, we don't have anyone here with uh, commenting whether, whether that would have changed anything. Probably not. There is the no variant. lot frontage of parts two and three will be, combined lot area will be 204.67. That number is correct. And in the, the lot, the above, uh, 220.49, is that, that you're saying that one's not correct? That should be 204.49. The same as the conveyed lot. Similar. Mm. There is no variance for lot area. Right, okay, so I, I, I don't know if it, we have to vote on that. I, I believe it's It's just if the committee, I was. Sure, sure by making that, I don't believe it's germane to the, uh, to the notice. There's a lot, a lot of stuff in the notice if anyone was concerned. Yeah. Doesn't bother me. Okay. I think we're okay. Do we need a motion on that or just uh, we'll say we'll change that? Okay. Uh, okay, Mr. Sir, Fletcher, if I can that's respond, just my concern. If I can respond that planning, here. You know, I, I, I hear your argument and we've seen it often where the basement counts um, and perhaps even decision could put that in brackets so it's not used as a precedent. I don't know if we can do that, that it's about the above ground and what the basement is. So that if someone tries to use this four years from now as a precedent, it'll be apparent that what was granted was not 1.28, but 88 plus the basement. That would be, uh, if you tied it to the plans on file, that's what the plans say. Okay, <clears throat> but people usually so do the, the research, they just go to the decision. I would like to see something in the decision, but. 
Yeah, that's fine. That's fine as well. And again, which, slide number. Yeah, of which X and and Y is the above, you know, basement which is out of the ground or something. We I think we've done that before. Well, if we're concerned about creating a precedent at one point two eight. So again, uh, my slide number one shows that there are a number of photographs, number of dwellings that have that condition. And that is what needs to be respected and reinforced when we're looking at the official plan. I don't, I don't disagree that you're gonna find uh, committees of adjustment decisions that may have different numbers, but they, they relate to buildings that were pre bylaw 569, 2013, that doesn't include the basement as part of GFA because of the established grade position. So that's where there is a difference, but where you can't just look at other committee of adjustment decisions and you can't just look at the statistics. You have to actually see what's happening on the ground. And when you compare apples to apples, including all these buildings on Rockcliffe, these are all on the same side of the street as the subject site. They include a, a garage, with floor area behind it and number of stairs and the grade at the back. So the FSI is gonna be comparable. And, and in the terms of the- is, so the topography is the same on that side of the street for the whole street. On the west side of, yeah. on the west side of Rockcliffe, the topography is the same, yeah. So let me see if I can come up with, um, I I would caution against saying the, 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 the basement, um, you know, I'm in staff's hands here because the yeah, zoning interpretation is that that basement is the yeah. first floor. Um, so I would say that the, uh, if you're looking to add, I'm just looking, I'm just scrolling through my. Uh, Perhaps I can ask staff, is there some way of discerning that if there's a, you know, concern that we won't want to say we're approving 1.28 without any uh reference to the fact that it's the basement inclusion that's causing this so that if someone pulls this up in four years they don't come into committee and say yeah ha, it's a precedent so franco the 1.28 or whatever the floor space index is for each lot yeah. that includes the basement correct yes so what about amending the variance if Mr. Romano could request this, where the proposed dwelling brackets, including the basement, close brackets, will have a floor space index of 1.28. That way it I'm good with that. Yep. flags it okay. off the top. Yes, I, I would agree with that. That's perfect. Yeah, that's assuming the other, the members are uh, realists is worthy of support, but I'm just saying in the event of that, I, yeah. I'm i more comfortable having something that yeah. comes out and hits you in the face and say, the committee did not give this and create a precedent to 1.28 above ground. Okay, um, any further questions or is someone ready to make a motion? Or, uh, um, I, I'd like to ask some questions. I wasn't sure if we were at the question period or not. Um, Mr. Romano, my understanding is not just that the uh, inside the house and lower level, which is really the basement, but by zoning called the first floor, but also the garage is now no longer excluded, where in some case it is excluded. So that this established grade line has come to us, I think every second meeting I've had, and I think we're now all understanding that established grade based from um, the elevations of the two abutting neighbors on either side and their grade, determines that you don't have a basement. And so we can't call it a basement. It's literally a first floor. Um, uh, so the word basement cannot enter into this picture. Uh, but I just want to emphasize as well that the, your number is also high because you cannot exclude garage where some cases you are. It's that snowball effect from the established grade. So I'd like, I'd like to uh, make a motion uh, to approve the variances uh, and tie them to the drawings on file. And that is the site plans as, uh, and the drawings, and uh, I believe that's what the applicant had said as well from the outside, correct? Yes. Yes, so that's my motion to approve, because I, I have a good understanding of how this established grade causes major issues for some sites. Thank you. 
Okay, and then to go back, just uh, Mr. Bellissimo, there's forestry conditions, there's the ch standard engineering conditions on a consent, that's all part of your motion? Uh, yes, whatever those conditions are, for, uh, I keep on forgetting about the forestry conditions. Yeah. But there's yeah, also the general yeah. engineering conditions, which I believe you were gonna go get because we didn't have it in our package, but that's a standard, the standard engineering condition with the municipal lumbering and the, the time limits for the consents and all that, okay. Very good. So thank yes. you for that motion, Mr. Bellissimo. Yep. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Just a question, Mr. Chair. Does Mr. Bellissimo's motion satisfy you with respect to documenting the rationale? Well, we're going to have the plans, and we'll also have that. We're, we're going to have that wording change from basement to, to first floor inclusion, or we. You, were, well, yeah, you plans, mentioned something about you were concerned about referring to it as a basement. So the plans refer to it as the basement level okay. so regardless of Correct. whether it's a certain amount above or below grade that's what the plans show and mr romano's also agreed to change the wording for the floor space index to say the dwelling including the basement correct okay. and the basement is as shown on the plans that are part of this application okay, i'll second that. seconded by mr taylor all in favor you have unanimous approval. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Romano. Thank you kindly, appreciate that. And I think you're the next one also, right? 31 B and C. Oh, another severance. Okay, another severance. Mm -hmm. um, and again, no one, no one present with uh, no neighbors. So this is uh, uh, there's actually two, a petition in support. Yeah, two eighty eight Beta Beta Street. Correct. Yeah, we have presentation, we have planning, ECS, forestry, and support. Yes, we do have support on this one. We have a little petition in support. Okay, so why don't you uh, give us a brief presentation, just quickly to walk through uh, consent and the variances. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a four page slide presentation that I'm going to walk through okay. with the assistance of staff. So the, this, is a, this is a property that's located on the west side of Beta Street. And what you're going to see on this map is that there's quite a diversity of lot sizes, and that includes semi-detached dwellings. So the semi-detached dwellings are, you're going to find are the smallest lots, both in terms of frontage and in terms of lot area. All the semi-detached within this neighbor, well, shouldn't say all of them. All of them on the street are less than the bylaw requirement. Within the neighborhood, 99% of the semi-detached dwellings are smaller than the bylaw requirement. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a common occurrence to find semi-detached dwellings on smaller size lots. 6.55 meter lot frontage is actually found on Beta Street. There's four of those. And within the neighborhood, there's uh, another uh, seven or eight that are not too far away from Beta Street. But, so Beta is one of the streets that does contain semi-detached dwellings on lots of 6.55 meters. And you'll see that in my statistics as well on this page. Um, in terms of lot area, the proposal would be a lot area that is smaller than the smallest lot size on Beta Street. By, but only by like three or three and a half square meters, which is an insignificant difference. So in terms of lot frontage and lot area, yes, the proposal doesn't fit within the majority of lot sizes, mm -hmm. but there's quite a few lots that also do not fit within the majority of lot sizes. And those include detached that are 7.62 meters and smaller, and semi-detached that I've already discussed. And I show that in my table as well, where even detached dwellings, 31% of them are smaller than the zoning bylaw uh, requires of 12 meter frontage and 370 square meter lot area. Yeah. So this is a neighborhood where, in the street itself, where the lot sizes are, uh, there's a diverse variety. And they have dwellings of two stories, two stories above an integral garage. And if we look at the second slide where I'm showing the elevations and the site plan, you'll see that the building is pretty close to where the building length uh, 
is permitted. 16.91 meters is proposed, and that's less than the 17 meters. The one side yard setback request of uh, one point, sorry, 0 0.91 meters instead of uh, 1.5 still allows for appropriate access. And it is a common actual, it's a common condition for semi-detached dwellings to have 0 0.9 and in some cases even 0 0.6 meter side yard setback. And in terms of the elevations themselves, it is a um, ground oriented, low rise, low profile two story dwelling and you'll see that at the bottom of slide two so it is an integral garage and one level of living above and the one of the benefits of having a semi-detached dwelling is that it actually presents itself as one building mm -hmm. as opposed to having the two detached which helps when you're dealing with a, a lot frontage of 6.55 meters yeah and we see some of those examples in the photographs that are above so, Mr. Romano, question, on this sir? one, you have seen the staff report on this one, or you didn't see this one either? This one's I have, October no, I saw this one. Okay, so this one, yeah, I saw this they're one. pointing it out, and I think it's a very, there's an argument here that uh, this would be the smallest lots you're seeing to create them by a, a severance. They think, I, I agree, they're saying that maybe the reason you're getting support is that there'll be a, a whole slew of people coming to this for the same thing. When you're having a lot frontage of 6.55 and a lot area that's so much smaller, uh, notwithstanding you just gave us the diverse lot patterning on the street as they stayed in the final two paragraphs i think you have a, to overcome that hurdle here because as you know you know creating a lot is a, more of a privilege than a right because you're seeking to create these these it's not an existing small lot um mm -hmm. the immediate lot only four lots of 43 have frontages of 6.55 each of these four have a lot areas larger than the proposed lot area of this application Majority lots of frontage range between 11.91 sure. to 15.24, and I guess the requirement is, is 18. So there are undersized from what's permitted. What's And it says, further, lot study shows a broader context. There are no lots with frontage of 6.55, and only three out of 170 have, lot, have frontage <laughs> smaller than 7.6. Should the application be approved, as proposed to result in the creation of two lots, which would be one of the smallest in the area, uh, so they think it's not in keeping, and then it goes on to say that they're concerned that the approval of this would weaken the established character of the neighborhood, result in applications, other applications of a similar nature. So where you have a requirement of 18 and you have most in the 12 range, you're suddenly going to have 6.55, because obviously by doing so, you build two houses where you have one, and why wouldn't any, everyone want to do that? It's good for, it is good for the more affordable stock than building one house on that lot. But um, it would certainly change the pattern because there, you know, anyone who has a 12 meter lot or 13 is going to come back and ask for two 6.55s, and they they feel that that's not appropriate. I feel you have a a hurdle to meet in, in in showing that that is relevant as opposed to like the last application. That's my opinion. Yep. Uh, do the committee members have any other so, questions for you, or so? How do you get around the fact that you're creating lots of 6.55? And lot areas in the 200 range when uh, the bylaw requirement is so much more, like almost three times. Well, there's a few there's a few things there, sir. Number one, 6.55 meters does exist, and it exists quite 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 a bit. 10 percent of the lots on Beta Street. There are there are four other lots of 6.55 meters. On, on Beta yep. Street. I think that's what I So this is an unusual, and there are other streets where that condition does not exist. So we're not looking to create a, a precedent because you have to deal with each application on its own merits. Yeah. But other streets may not be able to achieve that same sort of number. In terms of lot area, you would know better. the difference between what's proposed yeah. and the 223.4 square meters that is on the street is negligible. I, one will not notice a difference between a 220 square meters, which is what's proposed, 219.8 and 220, and the 223.4 square meters that exists in a handful of cases on yeah, Beta Street itself. But the minimum so, lot requirement is six fifty. I, I agree. Sorry? I think the, the planning report does say that there are a few instances, but to create new ones by a severance when there's only a handful out of 160 or 170 or something, 
that's just my that's my opinion. So um, thank yeah. you for that excellent. So I, so I, have, I have those I have those statistics as well because the broader neighborhood actually has lots down to five point zero eight meters. Okay. So this is not unusual for this neighborhood. And as I said, 99% of the semi-detached in this neighborhood are less than the bylaw requirement of nine meters or 18 meters. Mm -hmm. And they range from five and change, 5.08 meters to 7.6 meters. And there are actually 14% of the lots are 7.62 meters or smaller. And most of those 7.62 contain detached dwellings, mm -hmm. not semi-detached. Okay. Okay. So it's my opinion that, you know, we obviously have a difference of opinion with planning because they like to look at majority. I like to look at what is actually on the ground and what is on the ground is a diverse variety to which the proposal actually contributes to. And there's nothing wrong with that. To suggest that some other lots cannot achieve that same uh, condition to respect and reinforce the variety in the neighborhood, I think is, is contrary to what the official plan is actually looking to achieve. So out of those, would you agree that there'd be a plethora of applications? People would do, want to do the same thing if they have to get a lot severance and uh, build build that. So uh, I I hear what planning's saying on this one. Committee members, any questions for uh, Mr. Romano? Or if you, uh, I think when you're seeking to create the lot, it's it's a different situation. It's looking you have, you know, the people in support. Let's look at the support list. Are you giving us some 266, 264, 290, 273A, 260 artists? Any of these people, 278, two, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, just wondering how many of these people are uh, they're in favor because they want to do the same thing. Well, 266. Which, which there's and nothing wrong with that. Six. There's nothing wrong with that approving yeah. it because they want they, they want to do something similar. There's nothing That's, wrong with that. Uh, sorry, I can walk I can walk through them. 266 is a 7.62 meter wide lot, so they can't do it. 264 is a 7.62 meter wide lot. 290 is just let me find it here. Okay. Anyway, I, I didn't mean to have you go through all of that. I'm just I'm giving some sympathy to community planning is because you're creating these lots because it is a consent it's not just it's a consent but then very very large variances um, that's just my opinion and, uh, does anyone else have any questions for mr. Romano mr. Bellissimo any construction or nothing you vetted the plans well, in terms of construction, this, this, if you're asking me my opinion about constructions, I, I find uh, these houses are like typical where I grew up in the city of Toronto, Brockton, and they're, whether you allow 1.2, or 1 point the density. So this is changing the nature of the street to the what we have in the city that was built in the 1900s. So uh, I think that uh, there are places for this, but I'll let the other members comment as well. Yeah. Okay. And then I guess lead into that, so we need someone to make a motion either way. That's not me. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm kind of focusing on uh, the satellite view here, which shows the lotting pattern <clears throat> in the immediate context of this property. I see three building lots to the north up to Evans Avenue that are the same size as the subject lot. South of the subject lot on the west side of Beta Street, I see six similar size lots. Directly across the street from this property and running south, I see five similar size lots. So I'm not, I'm not satisfied that splitting this lot into two um, is compatible with the immediate context in this neighborhood. And my motion is to improve the consent and the minor variance applications. Okay. 
re refuse. Refuse. Okay, thank you, Mr. Taylor. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Okay, all in favor? Unanimous application has been refused. Thank you, Mr. Romano. We'll see you again. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, item 32 we've done, so we we'll move over to item number 33, 367 Rustic Road. Um, get to the right page. Uh, this is an application for a detached dwelling with an attached garage. There are five variances, cover letter. It's showing what's modified. I guess there's this was deferred from August 13, 2020. It was deferred for changes. And so it shows uh, the covering letter indicates what's been modified since it was last uh, before committee. Uh, transportation condition, I assume that's still applicable. And we had previous op opposition. I'm not sure whether we still have opposition or not given the changes. We can perhaps hear from that from the agent. And the agent is uh, Michaela Silva from MS Home Design. Uh, we have registered also the next door neighbor at 265 Rustic Road. And Norman Epstein representing the neighbor at 365 Rustic Road. Okay. It's Michaela Silva. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. Yes, uh, I am the designer and applicant for this application. Okay. Would you like a... Yeah, I think we should have a little... A, pre we have some people here in... Uh, or in the neighbor next door. I don't know if you've spoken to the neighbor or your client has spoken I to have. the neighbor at next door at 365, yes. but they have uh, they have some concerns. Um, yes, I did. I did uh, actually have a meeting with the neighbors, uh, both adjacent neighbors, uh, on site back in August, mm -hmm. and uh, you know to explain. And I did explain to them uh, the variances in question. Um, and uh, after us meeting, uh, it actually resulted in me adding a variance uh, to actually variance number two. If you look at variance number two, we've added that we are requesting now a variance of 1.5 meters uh, for the side yard setback from the east side lot line, whereas our original uh, application, we did not have uh, this variance in. We only had a variance uh, for the side yard setback on the west side. Uh, yeah, there was a mix. Line. That's why you had to defer in order to correctly identify the variances. Yes. I think they were reversed or something. It was the, referred to the wrong side. So, uh, have you've made yes. further changes? I said in my opening that you've uh, you've advised as to what uh, you've made some changes since then. Uh, we've only shifted the house itself. We haven't made any design changes. Um, okay. What we've agreed on site was to move the house a foot to the west side so that there is a little bit more setback uh, on the on the on the east side because that was the neighbor at number 65's concern that the house was too close to her property line and so you know together with the neighbor at the on the on the west side at 369 mm -hmm. we agreed that it was okay you know to shift the house uh, a foot over to allow more space for the neighbor so the house is you know further away Okay, so we now um, have the, we, we now have the correct variances before us, correct? So, exactly, yes, yes. Okay, we do have the correct variances before you, and uh, they did a uh, actually remember at the three sixty five. She did mention she had some concerns about variance number three and four, uh, and I did explain to her that uh, variances three and four they're old bylaw variances, um, and the way the the height of the dwelling is measured is from the crown of the road, and if you do go to page uh, one a six which shows the front elevation, you'll see how this height is measured and how the crown of the road is uh, 1.13 meters below the average grade. Mm. So, of course, on paper, this looks like, you know, we're asking for a 1.2 meter uh, height above what's allowed, but we actually, you know, when you actually see the house, it won't be you know, as high as it's uh, shown on paper. So, and th these two these variances, number three and four, which is for the height, uh, actually number three uh, is for the height of the dwelling and four is for the finished floor height, which again 
is measured from the crown of the world. That's why there's a, a big um, number gap there. Um, but is that the same thing for the first floor height? So that's both for the first floor height yes. and the dwelling height. You're saying it's yes, higher than yes. it really is because of the crown of the road is lower. Be exactly, yeah. And okay. these variances are not triggered under the new bylaw because we comply with them uh, the way it's measured, because it's measured mm -hmm. from the average grade and we comply with those variances. It's just old bylaw the way it was measured. Okay, so Madam Secretary Treasurer, yeah. is the applicant is correct that the, the height, the first floor height and the dwelling height is only a a variance under this old this old bylaw 7625 and that bylaw is then I guess hasn't fallen away because of certain appeals that are ongoing at the city but that's that it complies with the new bylaw the new citywide bylaw that's correct the height requirements are still under appeal which is why they're still being quoted in any of these uh, variances now as to whether they comply. I don't know. She's done a waiver, so she's relying on. Okay. Well, if she doesn't comply with the new bylaw, then she'll have to come back because she yeah. won't be able to get a vote. Mm -hmm. permit. But so that is, I believe, a rel some relevance that under the new bylaw, that this bylaw should have is only because of some technical issues that it's still before us, but that it does comply with the new That's city correct. bylaw. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? And then we have a neighbor to uh, we have to hear from. Uh, Mr. Epstein on behalf of uh, the neighbor next door. Um, I have a question on drawing A1. I think it's the west side of the building. There's some, I don't know. I can't tell what's on the side of that building. It looks like some brickwork or something, but it doesn't make sense that it's brickwork. Do, do you see what I'm talking about? Uh, on drawing 1A6? No, A, I believe it's A1 I'm looking at. A1. A1. And on the, I think it's the yes, west side yes, of the building, just below the 1.5 mm -hmm. dimension. There's. Yes. What What is that? Is that the roof overhang? That should be, that should have not have been there. Uh, no, A. Yes, that. Mm -hmm. A1, not A1A. Yeah. A1, the site plan. Yeah, that is the roof overhang that's uh, beyond the, uh, that's at the back. Yeah, because at the back we have a roof over the the first floor because the second floor recesses in like is indented in and that's what that roof is okay that's what that okay i couldn't so tell it's not a was. wall it's not a wall yeah okay, okay. That, thanks for the clarification okay anyway. if no one has any further questions for Ms. silva we'll move over to hear from mr epstein on behalf of the neighbor sorry um mr Hi. chairman um, Mr. Epstein will not be uh, speaking. Um, Himela Nankumar will be speaking on her own behalf. Okay. Okay, Mrs. Nankumar, how are you? Good, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and member of the Committee of Adjustment. How are you? We're good. I'm good. I um, one of our concern is um, it's just the, the height of, of the, the the height of the building. Um, in regards to uh, the variances, and that's what we just have a concern about because it's going to be a higher building, and we will have some, you know, the sunlight and natural uh, lighting on our property that will be taken away. But again, we're just questioning the height of the building. Okay, uh, the applicant is just given. I we're listening. I don't know if you've met or spoken to the applicant to your next or their neighbor about this before, but. A below uh, grade and therefore they, it's what they measure the height from so that really the height it only technically doesn't apply. I don't know, you have a, what do you have on your property? You have a one story brick, a um, that's the other side. You have a one story brick dwelling showing on this? Yes. Okay, so it's gonna be higher than, uh, than obviously than what you have. I don't know what your plans are for the future, but uh, she is claiming that, um, you know, and if it's, She's claiming that that extra height is uh, actually a technicality because of the way it's measured. Yeah, but it, and I don't know yeah, any so way of verifying that. Other than to point out that I believe we don't have any concerns from community planning. And if you've been listening this afternoon, community planning, when there are often uh, uh, have concerns with uh, with height variances of this nature, and they haven't weighed in, so. Ms. Silva's comment is that it really is only a technical height variance. Perhaps Mr. Bellissimo uh, can give us his opinion on that. 
and then the other members. So that's your concern is that the height, you see the number of 10 where it should be eight and your concern that it's, it's yes. be two meters um, higher than it's supposed that. to be and that's obviously would have an impact on you. Well, yes. Because or a greater impact issues. given you're in a one story dwelling and there's gonna be a two story. In, if it's two meters higher than it otherwise, it's gonna have even more of a concern. Right, because of the, the overshadowing, the sunlight, the natural lighting, and then plus my basement window are above grade levels and just the, just the privacy. Right, but I'm saying whether whether it's 8 meters, 10 meters, or 20 meters, your basement window is going to be affected already by what's there, I would imagine. Right. You know, but the existing yeah. uh, whatever's there, I don't know if they, even if... If there was no height. No, there's a the, the home is a bungalow right now. Right. So I'm saying you're going to be impacted by the height no matter what. Right, yes. Right, because if they build if they build it two meters lower and it was really six instead of eight because of the measurement, you're still going to be affected. Either right. way. It may be relevant more if you go and eventually you or some future owner of your home builds a comparable two-story home, you, you would, I assume, be able to build it to the same height. Which... Uh, She's saying it's just the technicality. And I'm going to ask her actually when we finish what her internal heights are just to make sure that the height isn't because she wants 10 foot ceilings everywhere. So perhaps we can ask that question. Any further questions okay. for, for the neighbor? Well, and, and then number four will tie into, as you said, the, the, the height of whatever ceiling she's looking at. Yes. Yeah, the first floor height and the total height are obviously related. Yes. Okay, right. so perhaps we can ask that of Miss Silva. So no one else has any questions for the neighbor. Okay, Ms. Silva. Um, yes. As you know, the neighbor is concerned with the height. She's in a bungalow, so she'd be affected by the height, whether it was six meters, eight meters, or ten meters. But that's. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're, you've advised us. In fact, this is not really. It's just a technical, um, a technical height issue. So my question is, what are your internal heights on the basement, first and ground, and the second floor on the house you're proposing okay. to build? Okay, so first I'd like to, uh, to let you know that uh, our proposed first floor height is uh, the same as the existing first floor height of the existing uh, bungalow that's there. And I would like to point out that which uh, is on the survey that I was done, uh, which is 152.14 meters. Uh, can you do it in feet? Ab above, uh, above grade, um, sorry? Uh, could you tell us in, with the ceiling, internal ceiling heights in feet? Oh, sorry, yeah. Ground floor, yeah, course, basement, uh, and first, second floor. Yes. So first, uh, ground floor ceiling height is 10 feet, and second floor ceiling height is 9 feet. And the basement? Basement, basement is 9 feet. Okay. But we're not raising our main floor uh, heights at all. Like, it's staying as it is based on the, for the, the existing dwelling that's there. And I would like to point out that her, her actual house, her finished first floor is a foot 0.3 meters uh, higher than my existing height. So she's actually, her main floor is actually higher oh. um, than my main floor as well. Yeah. Okay. But yes, of course, with the addition, with the second floor addition, I'm going to be higher than her. Uh, yeah. But, you know. You said something sunlight, about the existing. Yes. You said something about existing, but yes. this is a new build. So the existing has no relevance, correct? It has no relevance, yes. But when I was on site, I, I, was, I was explaining to her that, because her concern was the height of the main floor. She, you know, she said, oh, are you raising the main floor? Is that why you're proposing three meters instead of you know, the 1.5, which is what's allowed by the bylaw? And I said, no, we're actually you know, proposing 1.2 meters uh, from the average grade. And I referred it to the existing height of first floor because that's exactly where the, the main floor is staying like we're not raising it you know three meters from average grade we're okay. not doing that so yeah. the issue is uh, can you answer this question this is very relevant so the first floor height you're saying she's higher than you so is the 3.02 meter first floor height is that consistent with the neighbor's first floor height i think that's a very important because you're saying Measured she's out of the, the ground also the road? yes Yes, she is. She is out of the ground. So your first I, uh, floor height proposed is going to match what she has on her bungalow. It will match what I have, what we have currently on our bungalow. 
So she'll still be higher than me by a foot. Okay. On her current bungalow. Okay. Yeah. So even though, I don't know what your ceiling height is in the bungalow, but even though you're going to have a 10 foot main floor height with nine in the, in the second floor yeah. and nine in the basement, it's still going to be lower than what she has now. So you're saying she must have 10 floor it, height now on her bungalow. No, 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 I don't mean that. I just mean the height of the first floor like will be lower than hers. So, you know, because she was talking about, you know, the house is going to be much more, much higher. It will be higher. Obviously we're, do, we're doing a second story and, you know, like you mentioned, the one day that she wants to develop this, if she does, or the next neighbor, the next owner, you know, they're going to do something similar because I do comply in height under the new bylaw, mm -hmm. right? Which is the actual mm -hmm. height that's going to be built. It's, it's measured by the average grade. Okay. And there is no concern from community planning. I'm just looking. There's no. No, no, no. Okay. No. Um, committee members, any follow-up questions for uh, either the agent or the neighbor uh, or are we ready for a motion? Mr. Chair, I find the variances to be in keeping with the four tests under the Planning Act, and I move for approval subject to Transportation Department conditions. And there are no forestry? Or? No. Okay, we have a motion, Mr. Taylor. We have a seconder for that motion. Uh, I will second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Bellissimo. All in favor? You have unanimous approval, Ms. Silva. Thank you. Have a good okay. day. Okay, our next application is item 34, 38 Uno Drive. Um, uh, Secretary Treasurer Bartosik has declared a conflict and will be leaving the room. She is, resides within the, uh, in the vicinity. Uh, this is an application to construct a new detached, no, sorry, wrong one. As an application to a new detached dwelling with an attached garage, uh, there are three variances. Uh, we have an opposition letter to the first attendance. So the question is whether that is still relevant. We have a cover letter dated August 4th. We have email correspondence uh, dealing with the rescheduling and we have um, opposition that was to the last attendance. So this matter was deferred from July 30th, 2020. Okay, uh, we have on this application the uh, agent. So Mr. Mr. Chairman, Hassani. sorry to interrupt you. Um, Mr. Hassani will not be joining, neither will the owners of 38 Uno. Tony Pak and Hongwei Chen. Uh, the agent to speak will be Kyle Kadra. Okay, and there's no neighbor speaking now. No neighbors. Uh, perhaps we can have to ask him because there's letters of opposition. Uh, this matter was deferred on whether there are any changes. I'm just looking at this letter. Hello, Mr. Chair. Okay, so we have a new agent speaking here. Yes, Mr. Chair. I'm Kyle Kadra. I'm the agent. Okay. Um, uh, how about giving us a brief yeah. presentation as to what happened since the uh, deferral when this matter was before the committee July 30th, 2020, and what has changed for since sure. then? Yes, for sure. So, so uh, uh, our clients, the owners, did meet with the neighbors and uh, uh, took their notes. Uh, there were minor changes made to the plans to address their concerns and uh, uh, everything kind of settled that uh, they're okay with the proposal at this point. The changes that were made did not impact the variances on this application. Okay. Um, so yeah. So in terms haven't of changed. So we have all of these, I don't know what you changed, but we have, uh, there's no one here other than the next door neighbor who is supposed to be here. And mm -hmm. uh, the question is whether so my unders there was Sorry. a lot of opposition. I. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, there was some opposition and kind of some misunderstanding from the neighbors, Mr. Chair, and uh, like uh, our uh, clients did meet with uh, with them and uh, address their concerns. And afterwards also, uh, our client did send them another uh, cover letter uh, with their phone number to con contact them in case they have they still have any concerns and no one got in, got back to us which we took as confirmation that they are satisfied with the changes. Okay. Uh, committee members, any questions for the agent? Yeah, uh, just, sir, looking back at the um, July, original July 30th application. Yeah, your variances today are exactly the same. So I'm wondering what changes you did make. The variances are exactly what you applied for in he July. This out. He said he made changes, but it didn't affect the variances. So that's my question whether yeah, the yeah, okay. Okay. opposition could letters still apply. Yeah. Could you, so, could you tell us what yeah. the changes were? Because they didn't affect yeah, the variances. Yeah, I can give you some background on the concerns. So this property has a right of way between uh, uh, the two houses, uh, our house and the one next door. So um, this, this right of way allows access to our neighbor to get to the backyard and park their vehicles. Um, and uh, when we designed this house, we made sure that we do respect this right of way, obviously, and we uh, and the neighbor also asked us to uh, set back the house a little bit more uh, because their vehicles are somewhat large. They have like a large truck that they need to park in the backyard, um, and we did respect that. And uh, and uh, this is this kind of resulted in the wider driveway variance. Um, anyhow, the neighbor also, after they reviewed the application, they noticed that we had a door on the side that leads to this right of way, and they felt that this is going to create a, like a, an obstacle for vehicles and privacy as well. So we removed that door. That's pretty much the change. Okay, so I do note that you were the agent at the time, so I was concerned that there's a new agent and he's going to say he doesn't know and nothing's been but it was deferred you requested the deferral yeah, it was in me. order to revise the proposal to be more in keeping with the zoning bylaw and to consult with the concerned neighbors and then two of the neighbors mm -hmm. at 30 and at 40 and 35 spoke in favor of the deferral and uh, now we see that there's it's a little strange as we see that there is no change to the variances although you've just outlined that there is a change and we don't have anyone here other than we were supposed to have the next door neighbor but I guess they're not available now. So anyway, that's that's what we have before. So does anyone have any questions for the uh, agent who was the agent last time? I think that's a good thing because um, we don't seem to have anyone opposed at this point a couple of months later. Okay. So other than that is if someone's ready to make a motion. I'll uh, move for approval. Uh, variances are minor in nature and meet the uh, four tests in the Planning Act. Uh, move for approval subject to the uh, forestry condition requiring a city tree permit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Palmer. Uh, we have a seconder for that motion. Uh, Danny Bellissimo will second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Bellissimo. All in favor? Uh, uh, unanimous approval. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, that concludes the one o'clock session. <clears throat> Everything after this is the three o'clock session. So, Please. I don't know if you want to take a ten-minute break or anything. Sure, like that. sure. And you just have to read the yeah. verb again. Okay. So we'll come back and do thirty-five through till through to item forty uh, when we come back. So, for for all of the uh, people who joined in to WebEx or through the telephone for the three o'clock session, so items 35 through to 40. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, we uh, um, got, went a little bit late with the one o'clock session. Uh, we're gonna take a short break and then come back in approximately 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then I'll sound check you quickly and then the chairperson will give the opening remarks so we can continue with the hearing, thank you.